We're just going to take two minutes so that uh, Chantal can get some technical things here. Thank you for your patience. Okay, uh, welcome everyone to the XCAP meeting. It's uh, November 13th, and um, I'm going to let Chantal call the roll. Thank you. Gregory Braille, Phil Burton, Tony Carrasco, In Young Cho, Megan Kane is excused, Larry Klein, Judy Kleinberg is excused, Pat Lau, Adina Levin, Nadia Nayak? Here. Keith Rechtal? Here. David Chin? Here. Carrie Templeton? Here. You have a quorum. Thank you. And Adina will be coming in late. She's coming from a different meeting. Um, OK, we have uh, first up is oral communications. Uh, if we have speakers, you can go ahead and line up at the uh, microphone. Um, and uh, each speaker gets two minutes. And Judy Kleinberg has made it. Can I go ahead? Yep. Hi, Rachel Croft from Southgate. So um, attended the community meeting, and I thought it was really helpful to have so many people be there. Um, I was surprised because the communications went out. I hadn't seen them for a long time, so I was very glad to see as many people there as there were. But there were two things about it that I just wanted to bring up um, that is something I asked for before, and a couple of us has have. Um, on the viaduct concept, I believe there really needs to be clarity on where the viaduct would go, meaning will it go close to fences? And uh, it was shown, I think option two was shown, but how close will it be to fences? And can there be trees in a safety space between the viaduct and the back fences of the houses along Mariposa? So there is a survey, you know, a, along with the survey that was done in Southgate, there is now a Google group because they collected emails. It's only one way communication is allowed between Susan Newman and the community. And she's basically told the community that the viaduct concept includes space behind the back fences where trees could be planted. And I would just like to make sure that if we're considering a viaduct, we know more details about exactly what's in it for those people along the fence. We need accurate rending, renderings of what it would look like and dimensional specs before anyone can make a decision on what they want to do. Secondly, I think the AECOM person who is in charge of the noise table just was adamant that noise would be no greater if the train was raised than if it is on the ground. And there didn't, it seemed to kind of just belittle any questions about noise that particular rep. 
And then um, I think I'll just limit my comments to that. Thanks. Do we have anyone else under oral communications? Okay. I'm looking at Chantal and Ed. Is there a way to get clarification from um, AECOM about whether there can be trees between the back line of the fence, addressing what Rachel was raising? What's the comment? Oh, the comment was um, that during the uh, community meeting, uh, there was, uh, or sorry, that there's been questions raised about whether trees would be possible between a viaduct and the back of the fences along Churchill. And um, it, can we get clarification on that? Yeah, and can it be moved over further to the west? Oh, okay. Further east, sorry. Well, I think questions like that are really, well, inherently, I don't see why there wouldn't be, other than the question of species and how tall it grows and you know what would be involved there. Um, so that's kind of a categorical answer. But then the specifics would really be something that needs to be resolved as the work proceeds. Well, there's a two feet. And then there's 20 feet. There's no sunlight. So how can you grow a tree? This is all, quite frankly, facing west. So the sunlight is actually on that side of the structure. There's no shadow on that side of the structure. But it's only two feet between the property and the I understand. The it could be. I mean, again, I'm not trying to be argumentative. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But if it were a bougainvillea bush, it could go up a trellis. But Again, I'm not suggesting that that's the plan. No, I'm just saying really the, no the concern is necessary. that it's not a realistic, and then they put it on the table, so they need to come up with a better explanation. You can't just hand wave saying, you right. know, we can build a book, and yeah, we can build any species. You can't argue like that, right? If it's possible or not possible, clear question. I know I miss public comments, but could I just speak to this one thing? Because this is the only thing I would have said anyway. Sure, I'm going to allow you as the last public comment, and then we'll move on. I'm, I'm sorry for messing things up. Um, I did talk to Etty after the community meeting um, a bit about the prospects for moving um, a Churchill only viaduct over closer to Alma and creating space for <clears throat> plantings and, you know, using strategies for using the um, the westmost tr existing track as the first one track of the temporary track and then building a second track next to the fence and then being able to move over. And, and that would accomplish a few things, which is that closer to Alma, the grade of the right-of-way is lower than it is where the train is now. And so presumably you could kind of start from there to build your structure, which would overall make the whole thing, you know, seem lower and also move it further away, which would change the perspective on it as you look out from your backyard. And except for uh, maybe along the park area where it's the narrowest could leave room for uh, things. And she said that that was possible and she they'd done it elsewhere. So I just wanted to throw that out so that 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 there has been a little bit of discussion about that. So let me, oops, sorry, a little loud. Um, give you a little better answer uh, given that comment. Um, I do think as we go forward that part of the question might be treatments and options to address the issues that have been raised, which is, again, totally understandable, the, the very narrow distance between the potential structure, the vertical structure, and the back fences. And so um, uh, we'll need to talk to AECOM about how to address it. But I think the question is treatments, um, or one dimension is treatments, whether it be architectural, landscaping, um, what type of uh, measures would be used to buffer the structure from the fence. So that's one. The other is construction methods to um, modify the design or to, to um, maximize the spacing between the structure and the fence. I think those are both fair questions uh, that we uh, can talk to AECOM about. And you know, I think for the purpose of the decision making that we're all kind of marching toward or, or the, the discussion happens within, to what extent those options then factor into the 
choice of what are preferred options. And so we'll, we'll work with ACOM on how best to bring that back to XCAP. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll give you time for afterwards. Um, so we're gonna move to item number three, which is um, uh, adopting an XCAP screening process for XCAP to consider new ideas and iterations. Um, so the genesis of this thing was um, at the last meeting we discussed that uh, Larry and I met with Ed and Chantal to kind of go through um, what process we could have about looking at new ideas and considering those. So Ed, if you want, I'll give you the floor to be able to update that. Uh, maybe just a slight reframing. There are a couple of things we were talking about um, largely related to the question of technical review um, and they affect presumably both the existing options that were uh, already, uh, the seven that we're um, discussing publicly as well as potentially new ideas. So on the uh, new idea portion of it, like we were and again, I haven't had a chance to look at what you put forward for today, but talked about a few different options for how to allow an initial technical screening or just some considerations that the XCAP might want to take into mind um, when presented with a new idea and then procedurally how you would want to, as a group, address it. And so I, I'll let you expand on that one. Then on the question of technical review for the existing uh, options and, and any others as well, uh, I know that there had been some uh, individuals identified um, by one or more XCAP members uh, that are Palo Alto residents that have civil engineering backgrounds so might be uh, helpful in conducting a review. I think one, under that scenario, I'd suggest that you know, we'd be happy to have AECOM um, present uh, and share the work. Uh, you know, we in some ways uh, this takes the form of the design workshop that we had talked about previously, where it's basically uh, the engineers in sharing their work and and explaining the basis for those designs and those design concepts. Uh, so that's you know one step uh, of interaction. The question I think I would ask for, to the XCAP is how would the feedback from these individuals that, uh, again, are, are perhaps volunteering to participate, then factor into your decision making, your discussion, uh, and how do you want to participate in both the conversation as well as the outcome of those conversations? So let me, let me stop there, uh, Nadia, and turn it back to you. A quick comment. Uh, I also have an undergrad degree in civil engineering and worked for a number of years as, a, as an on-the-board civil designer. Okay. So, uh, Good point. Uh, and so, to that point, um, you know, I think I the question. The last meeting. You, appreciate that. So, it's a question of, you know, who, and quite frankly, how much credibility do you want to put to individuals that are either volunteered or voluntold, as we say, uh, to participate? And, you know, how does, how do you, as a group, want to stack that feedback um, and, and consider that feedback in the context of, you know, the work that our consultants have done, uh, the work that XCAP members who have your own expertise um, would want to um, factor into your decision making. I think that's a process question for you to talk about now. Okay. Thank you. Um, in our conversation with Ed, um, and I, I think he's stated accurately what we sort of agreed to, but with the exception of one point, which I'll come to in a, in a little bit. We saw this after a while as, as a several-step process because we can't go, we can't give in-depth consideration to everything that comes along, uh, or we'll never get it anywhere. Um, uh, but we do want to make sure that we do as good a job of vetting uh, as we can. So, uh, step number one, um, uh, and you can fill in the blank here. The blank is some number of the XCAP have to say, this is worthy of discussion, uh, th that uh, this is comparable to what almost any legislative body says, that, the, that the, you need a certain number of city council members, senators, or whatever before it gets any committee consideration. And you can say two or three or four or whatever number, but I think those are really the ones that are in, in play. <clears throat> and that gets us to hear 
a proposal in some depth or talk about it in some, some depth here without incurring any expense of hiring consultants. Um, and if then uh, a consensus of this group, or however you, however you want to define it, says that's a worthwhile idea, then step three would be we'd get it to um, a, uh, a technical review. Um, and this is where I'm not totally in agreement with what Ed said. Um, <clears throat> I thought we'd agree that AECOM would at that point review it, but uh, and he was saying in effect that our volunteer uh, uh, retired civil engineers would review it. Either way, um, with that technical information in hand, then it would be back to this group for whether or not we thought it should move forward, and if we should move, want to move it forward at that time, then it goes to the city council for um, consideration whether the council wants to spend uh, a fair amount of money, presumably, to really go into an in-depth technical review of the proposal. And all of this has to move fairly swiftly if we're going to uh, stay on our schedule. And anyway, that's what we came out with as a proposal to have some consideration of any new ideas, but not to get bogged down and not to think that we're going to have a new idea every week. If I would add to that, <clears throat> we've had uh, four, three civil, well, four civil engineers that have come forth that um, live in Palo Alto and are retired that we'd be willing to help the um, technical working group, which at the moment is Keith, Tony, I think you, Phil, um, and I'm sort of observing, and Adina, but I'm, Adina's going to do the cost part, but not so much the technical part. Um, and so uh, uh, the idea was to review also the, the documents that have been put forth so far. So Ed, did you want to explain about the documents in AECOM's review and what's happening? Uh, okay. I just switched sides at the table. I don't know if you've got any more recent info than a week ago? Okay. So um, just to give you a, a sense of the interaction, um, AECOM had been, has been working with Caltrain to get their review of basic design criteria and um, I don't know that assumptions is the right term, design criteria is really the best term. Uh, and um, I don't know that that's been finalized yet. There have been some back and forth uh, between the two of them, or two, two organizations. Uh, there also um, is a document that Caltrain produced uh, that explains their design exemption, exception process. Uh, and I think that one's ready to be released publicly. So um, I have no concerns about that. The other document that uh, AECOM has been working with Caltrain on are the cost estimates. And I think there are some review that uh, AECOM or some approval that AECOM would like to get from Caltrain to ensure that uh, there's no disagreement as to what the factors and the methodology would be for that cost estimation. So that back and forth has been happening. Um, I, I take it at this point has not been finalized, um, but we are expecting that to be final at any time. So that said, you know, the reality is that all of these are, are public documents or public records to the extent that they are with us. We've just uh, been uh, quite frankly respectful of not wanting to throw a monkey wrench in the relationship between AECOM, ourselves, and Caltrain. Uh, to have uh, documents out there that Caltrain feels that they would have to disavow. As in they, they disagree with them? That, that's the point. So sorry, the, but that means that the, the videos that we've been shown so far were based, uh, have been based on the documents before Caltrain reviewed them? In other words, for example, in South Palo Alto, you have the trench and the, vi the viaduct and the hybrid moving away from the train track. So what you're saying is those the videos are a product of the work that AECOM did before it got full Caltrain review? I think, um, you know, we've, we've talked about take grade as an example. AECOM's been very explicit about where it's clearly not needing Caltrain design criteria. But beyond that, they're doing their best to stay within the criteria as Caltrain would dictate them. If they're expert, why are they not following the guidelines? 
of the cod train provides. Well, so again, grade, there's an exception. The, it's the 1% is the Caltrain standard. And, and if that were adhered to, then we couldn't do many of the concepts that we're discussing. Mm -hmm. So that's where, once again, the process that Caltrain would use to review and either approve or deny uh, an exception to their standards is, is one, one of the documents that uh, has been going back and forth. Um, how long are we going to wait for Caltrain? Well, you know, I would suggest that um, if there's a technical group, then the technical group use see those documents and review them. Uh, we're just, again, a little apprehensive of pushing it out, let's say, online or elsewhere. No, no, uh, I, 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 I appreciate that, but uh, <clears throat> if we're going to stay with our April 30th timeline, uh, uh, and those are important for other people to review besides our, our technical people, um, at some point, we have to say our, uh, this, this consideration of, of uh, Caltrain's feelings uh, has to end. And, and so I don't necessarily want you to say uh, January 2nd or something like that, but it's, it's got to be something like that. Agree. Agree. Well, we don't get a choice, do we? I mean, if we come up with a, with a proposed solution and Caltrain says no, it's not like Caltrain's feelings. They said no, right? Correct. I mean, if, if, if Caltrain says no, you may not build a railroad with greater than 1% grade, then what recourse do we have? Fair you question. said something about Caltrain's feelings. I'm trying to understand, is this really about Caltrain's feelings? <laughs> no, it, it is, when, it is when, what Ed is talking about. Okay. It's a matter of professional courtesy. Yeah. Uh, but it also runs afoul of, of the Public Records Act. Uh, Caltrain can't tell us not to disclose it. Without telling us. Yeah, okay. Well, they can't know. Even, <laughs> okay. if, even if they said, we don't want you to put it out to the public. Uh, yeah, okay. I, I understand what you're right. saying. You're, yes, yes. Yeah, but I, Go I ahead, Tony. Uh, Tony and then. Sorry. Go. So, uh, Ed, as you noticed from the questions during the public part of this thing, there's a great need now for very accurate dimensions. and. And I think in our group, Keith has been able to be precise enough to one inch of track top to, to <coughs> so forth. So we have the capability to, to do this and understand it in a fraction of time than AECOM will, will or Caltrain can. And in order to do our work well, we need much more clear pictures of, not pictures, but surveys of the track and the height of, heights of these tracks. What I've noticed is that we're using uh, high-speed rails profiles, and it's LIDAR, as you said. Um, and I think we need a better survey to do mm -hmm. our work well. Tom? Yeah, I just want to say that regardless, not, not to be contrarian, but um, so far, I think the, pro the professional relations have been very smooth and productive. They may not be as fast as we want. And I think it would be an important goal to try to preserve the productivity because there are plenty of ways that a bureaucrat can appear to be cooperative, yet in, in reality just stall, 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 and stall, and stall us to death with nitpicking. And we all know that. I just want to make that observation. Anybody else on, on the next cap? So I think one of the things that we had discussed was um, the idea of having uh, the um, documents that are still being reviewed by Caltrain in their, in their interim form um, potentially be reviewed by the technical group and the civils that have offered to help us um, in sort of a pre-meeting and then try to have a meeting with um, AECOMS folks and the idea would be to review both any new ideas that would come forth today and, um, in addition, review any questions that the group had about the existing alternatives that have been made and then bring that back to the XCAP at our next meeting. Um, and so what we're looking for under this agenda item would be um, if that process is acceptable to everybody, um, we would vote to have how many, we would decide how many XCAP members it takes for a new idea or iteration to get evaluated by this kind of pre-screening process. And then um, 
we would, in, under the next item, hear whatever new ideas there might be and then deliberate on the ideas that are presented and if there's any new ideas that we, and we, we could vote on each and decide, okay, how many votes did it pass to the next pre-screening level? And um, the idea would be that before, uh, I'm, we're supposed to give a council update on December 9th. So prior to December 9th, our next meeting is December 4th. So at the December 4th meeting, um, the technical working group and uh, whatever stuff they can get done with the ecom and the civils would come back to this group and report back what um, has come forth so far in terms of technical review and the screening of those ideas. And then um, once we've heard all that at our next meeting on the 4th, we would as a group decide whether, um, uh, you know, if they passed technical screening or if there's foreseen issues, we would vote which ideas could potentially move forward and decide what we would then request formally for city council to, to as a recommendation for them to decide if they wanted to pursue this further. Um, and anybody who doesn't get it, doesn't, didn't see our notice for today, even though it was also agendized at our last meeting, if there are still other ideas, um, those people always have the opportunity to go to the city council meeting on the 9th and, and write to the city council then. In other words, we're, we're trying to be the, the place to go, but we recognize that there's still, you know, if, even if we vote not to move something forward, if somebody feels really passionately, they can still go to the council. Um, so that was the kind of the concept for today. Um, but the understanding being um, with Ed and the team that we're trying to get a meeting, because of the timelines, we're trying to get a meeting with that group this Sunday. So, um, Ed, is it possible then that we could get the interim documents this Friday? Okay. Um, and that is the, uh, we would need it to include as much engineering specs as we have and also the cost estimates. Um, so that would be the proposed idea. Um, does any XCAP member wanna talk about that or have questions? We can go to um, public comment and then we can come back to deliberate if there's no if there's nothing at this time. Go ahead, Dave. So, so just so I'm clear, how do you want to take submissions? They need to come to one of us. Is that what I'm hearing, or are they no come to submissions XCAP? in the next item? We have it agenda okay, so, so people can here. make their submissions. Okay. Yeah. Uh, any submissions between now and the next meeting, then, or no? Um, or they have to be done at these meetings? If they can be done at this meeting, great. If not, they can always go to the city council yeah. meeting on the 9th, because the problem is we don't have enough meetings. I mean, I'd love to keep ideas open, but this we agendized it for the previous meeting, which didn't really happen, and then also this meeting. And you know, if something else comes forward and we can still get it, great, but otherwise they're gonna have to go straight to city council because we just don't have time in our schedule to review it. That's kind of the concept. Uh, so then now we're gonna figure out today uh, how many XCAP members it takes to yeah, okay. so, so we'll take public comment, and then we'll come back, and then the idea would be for us to vote, okay, do, how many do we want? Two members of FlexCap, four okay. or six? And then once we've decided what that process will be, then we'll hear the public's, um, uh, we'll hear the presentations of new ideas. Any other questions before I go to the public? Okay, great, so uh, public, you'll have two minutes for this item. Please line up. Thank you, so. Five is when you have presentations. This is for public comment on item number three. If I may, item three is what process we're going to use. Item four is for actual presentations of new ideas. Good. All right. So Caltrain have had engineering standards since 2011, and they were posted on their website, a way uh, public record. And this is what we're using right now. They pulled them off, but we made them pull them back on the website. And they have been working on new engineering standards, I would say, for at least 18 to 18 months to maybe a couple of years. And hopefully, Nadia, this is what you're going to be getting on Friday. And what we're expecting to see in there is new clearances for the electrifications, for the poles and all that, and then more uh, technical specification, which hopefully will be incorporated from the high-speed rail, including how we increase the track speed to 110. But let me just wrap up very briefly here about what it says in the 2011 um, documentation. So you Google Caltrain Engineering Standards. I'm in cha Chapter 7, which is the tracks. I'm in se Section 7.1, which talks about the grade. It does talk about the 1%, and then it says maximum design gradient with curve compensation at 0.04% per degree of curve, if applicable, for grades of up to 2% may be implemented for new construction projects with approval 
of the Caltrain Deputy Director of Engineering. And this is what we've been using. We've used, right now, we're using the worst case scenario, which is 2%, thinking that moving forward, we're gonna be reducing the grade. But we'll definitely be above 1%. There's no way out of it. Hello. So uh, when I hear about new ideas, and it got brought up in the public comment, I think, too, I think there's kind of two classes of ideas. One is brand new concepts, which there's, I guess, a presentation coming. The other is I call them more like modifications of current things and somehow trying to capture those separate from new ideas. Because like the fencing and the spacing of a viaduct and, and I talk to the engineers, there's some ability potentially to lower the viaduct a couple feet if the road's depressed a little bit where it's going over. So those I consider are modifications of the core idea. And those can help or not hurt, help, depending. And a way to s segregate those, kind of capture those, and not say no go, just separate from kind of a whole new way. Thank you. Yeah, my, my comment is a little along those lines. Um, I wondered if there were any possibility in this process um, for revisiting <coughs> Discarded ideas. I may have missed this discussion. I think I heard you say that you were only looking at new ideas or modifications of ideas that are already on the table. And the only reason I'm asking that is that I had understood through some conversations that um, there had been some recalculations on um, the feasibility of a hybrid at Churchill if the calculations were redone in certain ways. And I, I don't know any more about it than that, but um, I just want to ask the question about whether something like that can be brought forward, if, if there's an advocate for it. Um, so just to answer that question specifically, so um, yes, we're, the modifications we're calling iterations. Um, and the, the, the general concept, if the group is amenable, is that the um, technical group and the um, civil engineers that will be helping us will, will actually basically be highlighting what are the exact things that are you know, laws of physics that cannot change, and what are things that may be a standard but may also be uh, an opportunity for design flexibility that could potentially lead to other solutions. So I hear you on the, you know, how do we make the existing viaduct better, that sort of thing. Um, so I just want to be clear. Um, in terms of ideas that were discarded, um, uh, same idea. There's probably things that may have been discarded because there were things that were considered hard and fast rules, and the question is what what's changed. I think... Um, you know, there's clear things that have been discarded that, like um, the citywide tunnel in terms of the amount of eminent domain, that's a different batch, I would say. So, um, uh, that, yeah, so some are clear, but I will leave it up to the group. So, Larry, did you want to let you go there? I want to make a motion so that we can formalize our, our, our process, but I, I would just want to say that uh, there are always going to be minor design modifications to anything we do, and, and that's not what we're talking about here today, uh, or else we'll never get anywhere. Uh, uh, but uh, conversely, whatever we decide on, whether there's seven alternatives, eight or, or, or nine, uh, however the council moves forward, there are going to be changes. You, you don't have a large project like this without modifications one way or the other. Okay. Um, I would suggest that the process we use and so move that, uh, uh, that our screening process be uh, that we hear, <clears throat> one, that we hear any proposals, <clears throat> two, then for the ex-cap to consider it, uh, at least two members of the ex-cap have to say, let's consider that. Uh, uh, then we have whatever discussion is appropriate and have a preliminary vote or consensus as to whether there's enough uh, there for the ex cap to refer to the technical review. And the technical review would be occurring in the next few weeks, and it's either uh, just our volunteer retired civil engineers or the AECOM people, if uh, Ed can arrange that, or both. Uh, with, the hmm? with the working group. Yes, with, the, with our work, working group. Yes, thank you. Um, and um, 
that uh, then the technical review <clears throat> of that sort comes back to us as the full XCAP at our next meeting. Uh, and then we decide at that point whether uh, there is uh, sufficient merit for us to recommend it for a full technical review um, by the city council, and for the council to authorize a full technical review and spend the necessary consultant money. And that, that's the five-step process that uh, I recommend in our motion, my motion. Does it, do we have a second? Tony. Tony. Tony does. Great. Tony seconds the motion. Do you want to speak any further to your motion? No. Tony, how about you? Nope. Dave? Uh, two questions. Um, just wondering you're thinking about the number two and what, where that came from. <laughs> Versus three, four, or one? I think it's rather arbitrary. Uh, okay. I, I can't. Uh, uh, I want to make sure that we have... Uh, some control that we don't spend a lot of time without at least some support from the XCAP members. Uh, and uh, if somebody says three rather than two, I'm not going to get a big argument out of me. But uh, I, th I think it's just how you sort of feel things are right as to what the threshold should be that an idea has to have before we spend the time of, of the whole group uh, on it. Uh, second question is, um, do you have a sense for what technical review, the first one, uh, would entail? Do you mean just technical or engineering? Or did you mean a little bit look into how costs or political or anything like that? Just engineering? Uh, yes. That's the group that we're convening starting this Sunday. Um, which is, which is, again, to, just to repeat, would be the retired civil engineers that we've managed to recruit, plus the working group. And uh, if Ed could get them, uh, <clears throat> some input from AECOM, though they might, don't have to be there at the same time. But the input would be in time so that we could consider the, pro the, the proposal or proposals at our next meeting, which is on December 4th. Can I propose an amendment to your uh, sure. motion? Um, I'd like to propose changing the two to, to four. And the reason why I say that is just simply, we've got a lot of people who've been on CAP before this and have been in this project for quite a long time. Um, I think we could do a, a temperature check on things pretty effectively as a group, e even before it hits the technical group. And I think there'd be a lot of value in just a little bit more people uh, on it before it gets there. Can I ask another clarifying question? I'm sorry. Um, we'll, we'll continue with what Dave proposed, I guess. Well, I'm amending. Yeah. Sorry. I'm amending his motion. I'll wait for you to do that first. Uh, proposing amendment to his motion. <laughs> uh, I'll second the uh, amended motion uh, for discussion. Larry, I'll let you, how do we do the straw vote? I'll let you do it. No. Well, why don't we just have a, instead of going through Rapid amendments, why, yeah. uh, why, why don't we just have a straw vote as to between two and four, or maybe two, three, and four, whichever the, the group, and then we, I mean, there's no big arguments you can make one way or the other. Uh, uh, is that amenable to two, what, yeah. two and four, or two, three, and four? Anybody for three? There's a motion and second, No, 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 we're going through a straw vote. We're going to do a straw vote. We'll leave it up to the chair. Have to withdraw it. Okay. Would would the amender and the second be willing to withdraw so we can do a temporary straw vote? I'm not willing to, to withdraw it. <laughs> okay. So, are you willing to accept the motion, the, the amendment? Um, no, I want to see what the. I, I don't have any. I, I don't really care, but I want to see what everybody wants. Not not just. The, we'll see it. So the, this is the way to have the vote between two and four. The Are these the Roberts rules of order that we don't follow uh, that I'm hearing about now? Uh, okay, is, just checking. This is, this is my worst nightmare because I just only budgeted 10 minutes for this part of the conversation. So I'll just say, um, I'm looking for guidance. Go ahead. Okay. 
All right, so we can do discussion of the motion and of the amendment, is what Chantal is saying? No, if we're going to do this, discussion is limited to the amendment. Okay, so, all right, discussion on the amendment. I'm just worried about simplicity. I, I think four is too many. I would want either two or three. It doesn't have to be perfect. If it comes through here and we don't like it, we just say, get lost. I, yeah, I would tend to agree on that. Two is basically a minimum to say this idea is not totally crazy or it's not coming from a partisan group who has a certain agenda. I actually like three, but two is fine. Um, if four, we might as well just all have a vote, in my opinion. And just to clarify, this is, this is simply if we hear something today, then we have to take a vote of two, three, or four to then say the technical review people will then look at that. It will still come back no, to the... No, no. No, then we have a discussion on it. And, and Use your mic. She's, she's. No, that, the, this vote is just to get it on the table. Then you have discussion. And then it needs a consensus, a majority or three quarters, whatever you want to say, uh, for it to move forward. Just, so it's a two step process. Okay, does this number of people, two, three, four, require a quorum or not? We have a quorum. But if we didn't? Then you can't have a meeting. It's right. happening in a few minutes. I think for the sake of time, two is, is fine, at least initially, because it's going to have to be reviewed anyway. So if two people, and as you said, a lot of us have been here for a long time reviewing various <laughs> ideas, I think two is sufficient. So we're voting on, go ahead, Judy. Um, I was just going to say to the, the mover <laughs> uh, that there seems to be some support for three. And that's sort of a compromise. And if you feel strongly that two isn't enough, and I think there were some other words used about what could happen if it's just two, if you're willing to amend your motion to three, there might be some support for that, and we could move on. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, I'm only to change my number from four to three. Okay. Second. I'll accept it. <laughs> okay. So now we have. Okay. Yeah. We, we, all right. So now we're looking at three. So we're voting on three. So Larry, can you restate your? Uh, if, no, we, we, no, we don't need a vote now. That's right. Uh, we, the motion, the, the main motion has been changed to three. And I, uh, <clears throat> so I've accepted the amendment. So the amendment is part of the motion. And now we're back to the whole process. The main motion. So I'm sorry. What? <laughs> I, I'm going to let you drive, man. <laughs> we're back to the main motion, which set forth a whole series of, of, of steps that had to be taken before we get it on the December 4th agenda. Okay. We, before, by it, I mean any idea, new idea or new iteration. Okay. So we're taking a vote now on whether we accept a new idea will take three people. No, 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 we've already accepted. The whole thing. The whole thing. The on the whole, whole sorry, on the whole motion, but I'm just re-clarifying the number. That's what I meant to clarify. No, that's just one part of it, though. There are several other parts. Okay. Go, do you want to restate your motion so that we've got it? Just or maybe Chantal could restate it. What you have, exactly. Thank you. Oh. You guys have such faith in me. Uh, <clears throat> the, this is the process by which the XCAP will consider new ideas. Uh, Five-step process. Step one is hear any new proposals. Step two is in order for the XCAP to consider it, at least three members of the XCAP have to say, let's consider the idea, some kind of vote. Step three is discussion. Step four is a preliminary vote or consensus uh, for the technical review to then happen. And then step five is once the technical review comes back to the XCAP at the next meeting, then the XCAP decides if there is merit for a full technical review to send to the city council and spend money subsequently. Excellent. Correct. I, I have a question. What I think I'm hung up on is 
it's possible that in the explanations that we give today, because every presenter only has five minutes, there isn't enough information for there to be a full consensus of the group that that is at least warrants enough. In other words, no? Okay. All right. All right. Let's vote. Uh, all in favor of Larry's motion? Aye. Any nays? Any abstentions? Great. Okay. So now we will move on to um, item number five. And I'm just, just for the sake of the agenda to make it clear, um, we will move the, um, uh, the evaluation criteria conversation, I think, to next time because we're going to run out of time for sure. So I just want to make sure that we have enough time to discuss the, the new ideas. There also isn't much of, I will give an update about it during the XCAP updates section, but there isn't much information because the group hasn't been able to meet. So I just want to make sure everyone knows we've got some room there. Um, okay, so the next item is going to be review and screen new ideas by XCAP. Um, I am aware of three, four, there, I think there's a fourth. There's four so far. Um, and uh, we will have, so this is four, four new ideas slash iterations. They will be presented by members of the public. Each presenter will have five minutes. Um, there's been three people who've turned in something that is going to be put up on the TVs. I'm not sure about the fourth person. They, not, they may or may not have brought something. <laughs> um, so, okay. Um, anyone who wants, Tony, did you want to go first since you're on XCAP and so you are one of the presenters? Oh, Chantal, yeah. Just clarifying, in the packet, this is agenda item number four, so there's a cover memo just explaining what it is. And then there are the three proposals that are attachments one, two, and three. Attachment one to item four is from Mr. Michael Price. Attachment two is from Tony Carrasco. And attachment three is from Roland Lebrun. So if you are, whatever order you're going in, it'll help the public to just refer to those numbers. Okay, and with all due respect to Mr. Price, I'm gonna let Tony go first since he's closest to the mic, but I'll ask you to get near the mic so you can go second. So for those in the audience, we're looking at uh, attachment number two right now, proposal by Tony Carrasco related to Embarcadero traffic. So, last four. Okay, I will, right. let me hold it up so everyone so. can see. It, it's, yeah, it looks like this. So, can we go to the next slide, please? So, here's a clarification. I think when we were the CAP, before the X CAP, there are a number of us. And I want to tell you who the team was or who, who participated in this. While I, I drew most of it, the input came from a number of people. Um, I want to t uh, Dave um, Chen was part of this group. Nadia was part of the group. Jason Matloff from the Old Palo neighborhood. Hannah um, from XCAP. Yuriko and others. Um, what we looked at is a little different, looked at it differently than the engineers would look at. We asked basically what would fit Palo Alto, what's the nature, what's the DNA of Palo Alto that feels comfortable for us. And a lot of us then went to this roundabout. This is a roundabout in Holland. It's beautifully prioritized by peds and bicycles. Bicycles and peds dominate more than cars. You can see the round red path, which is bike and peds. And we thought it would, a roundabout here would fit well with Palo Alto. Next slide. Tony, I'm sorry, I'm gonna, ex can you explain where that would be? Because I don't, I don't think anybody sorry, understands Nadia. where that is. So can you, uh, any team member please Jump in, it's a team thing. Do you want to explain it, Nadia? I, I was gonna have you just explain what, so the, the idea here is to bring Embarcadero back up to grade, meaning you'd fill it back in, and so it would be flat there, which, but you, in that drawing, you'll have to explain what the quadrants would be. That's, That's the next saying. slide. Great. But, but if you go up one. Um, so th this is a compliment to staff. I mean, this is a, the least expensive, I, I think it's not, don't think we can get cheaper than this. 
but it doesn't feel like Palo Alto, in, in, in my opinion. And um, I've heard from several people in the neighborhood that it doesn't feel like Palo Alto, although it's probably the least expensive option, which we should not just say no to, right? We can't. The, the next slide. So we then took that Dutch roundabout and see, checked to see if it would fit in this area without any takings. And it by far has a lot more room and can fit here. Um, so then we go into how, do, how is it constructed. All of this is going to grade, which the undergrounds get covered up. It always requires a viaduct to be able to lift that uh, train off the equations down below. Um, we need to build shoe fly, fly tracks, then a viaduct, and then we'll need to connect roadways, then um, close down Alma, which is in operation during the construction. Uh, the next slide. Uh, the next one after that. So we then looked at a, a sort of a hybrid which can be modified in many ways, and there have been many suggestions after this drawing. You can see that the bike ped still uh, goes around in red. It's, again, a bike priority and ped priority. So what does this do? Uh, it sort of captures the feel of Palo Alto, just like the Dutch roundabout did. It, I mean, my, my view of Palo Alto's DNA is the foothills and the baylands, and it's about landscape and how many trees you can get there and how pleasant is it to, to drive by. Um, we've passed this idea past Mike Wall, Wall work, who's a roundabout designer who did the Stanford roundabouts, and he says this concept will work. Um, it is a hybrid because Embarcadero keeps operating underneath and Alma on top. Um, we need to build a couple of roads, and then there have been suggestions about why, don't the, why doesn't the roundabout become smaller and another road connected to Embarcadero. So there are many tweaks, but the general idea, I think, should be studied because it seems to fit Palo Alto. Now, t I'll tell you why it, it fits. Uh, in order to connect, I think, the Professorville neighborhood can now connect under the viaduct to town and country. It makes it much more walkable. It makes the value go up, at least in today's uh, ways in which we value walkable neighborhoods. Um, Palo Alto High School gets a, uh, an opportunity to add another entry at the roundabout and be able to be able to get car, I mean, the deliveries through a different entrance and the pedestrians through the existing bridge crossing to town and country. Town and country also can add some more attractive pieces of building to attract the students who come over for lunch, thereby re uh, reducing the traffic on the intersection that now goes directly into town and country. So I have to thank a lot of people here to, who have sort of looked at this, and I apologize for putting you to sleep. <laughs> Your five minutes are up. Great. So, um, Mike, you can go next. And then we'll come back with questions or discussion. So I want to talk about an option for grade separation at Churchill that doesn't involve closing the intersection uh, by using an underpass. Now, an underpass was considered before and was rejected because it takes a lot of private property. So um, what I wanted to do is find a way of using an underpass to keep the intersection at least mostly open and avoid taking any private properties. And so that's what this proposal does. It also keeps Caltrain at grade so there's no viaducts or berms or anything, Vi uh, train stays at the uh, grade level. So can you go to the next one? So why? So the question is, why do you take properties when you do a, a, an underpass? And the reason is you break the connection between the driveways and the, and the road when you're bringing the road below grade. So the thought here is to avoid doing that by leaving one lane of Alma at grade on the right-hand northbound lane. 
so that the houses along Alma continue to get, or continue to get access to Alma, even though they were building an underpass right next to them. So you can see here we've got the right-hand lane. This is looking north on Alma at the intersection. The right-hand lane stays at grade, so that you can see the driveways there. Um, and then the left-hand lane and the left turn lane on to Churchill go down below to the, uh, to the underpass. Um, another consequence of this is the Churchill through traffic is broken. So you can't get from the west side of Churchill to the east side of Churchill. It's just not possible. That means that people who want to get to Embarcadero coming from El, El Camino are going to have to turn north on to um, Alma and then go on Kipling over to Embarcadero. And that means that the through traffic that travels on Churchill now from El Camino down to Embarcadero is just stopped. So you go to the next one. So the next one is looking at the intersection southbound. Again, you can see the, the, this is the uh, looking southbound along Alma. So the, the left-hand lane of Alma northbound is, is, at, is at grade, and it joins here. And then the uh, southbound lanes go down. We've eliminated the, the left turn lane on the Churchill because now we're below grade, and we've eliminated the right turn lane on the Churchill going west because there's no need for it because there's no queuing at the, at the intersections any longer. Uh, the roadway right now, nominally, Alma is about 45 feet wide, and at Churchill intersection, it's 56 feet wide. And this, this space here is 56, so we're staying within the current roads, road size, so it fits within the current uh, constraints of the road. Next one. Uh, this is looking at the intersection from uh, west side of uh, Churchill. Again, we have the same problem. If we lower the Churchill down the intersection, it breaks the connection with houses along Churchill or between Castellet and Mariposa, so we leave the right-hand lane of Churchill at grade. This provides access to Mariposa, at least for coming in off Churchill. Uh, and then you can see that the, the uh, bike and pedestrian traffic uh, moves over across the intersection here and goes, let me show it this way. Tra bike, pedestrian traffic come up here and across a pedestrian bridge over Churchill and through a tunnel to go to the other side of uh, Churchill or they hit and this is the access from the uh, bike path along um, the high school. The next slide. This is looking at the intersection from the, the east side of, of Alma. This is, this is the east side of Churchill. Again, you see the exit from Churchill is only northbound. Uh, can't turn left onto Alma because it's down below grade. And then there's a bridge over uh, the um, intersection for bikes and pedestrians to cross over the intersection. And then uh, there's a tunnel that goes underneath the railroad tracks, which is the next slide. This is looking at it uh, more at a higher perspective. There's a pedestrian bridge over Churchill for pedestrians on the bike path along Palo Alto can cross over Churchill and continue on without having to interact with the, the um, traffic on Churchill. And then there's a bike pedestrian path that goes across the intersection and down underneath a tunnel under the tracks and then comes back up onto the other side of Churchill. And next slide is just a, this is what that bike path looks like. There's a tunnel that goes underneath around the way. So the idea here is to give the, is to get the pedestrians and, and the bicyclists as much away from traffic as possible. Um, but what we've done here is we pre preserve the ability for most of the traffic on El Camino that comes down Churchill to turn north or south onto Alma, which is what most of the traffic does anyway. Um, and we've added some constrict, there's some restrictions, which is sort of the compromise between trying to get the, something for the intersection uh, working but not taking any private properties, which is the big goal. Um, this tunnel does intersect with the, uh, encroaches on more onto the right of way with uh, Caltrain, so they may object, so there are some alternatives that route the uh, tunnel differently, um, which we can talk about, but bringing the tunnel down through a different path, but that's basically the idea. Thank you so much. Um, next presenter will be Roland. Okay, so this this is what this is about. We are revisiting the um, uh, Meadow and the Charleston Tunnel. Next slide. Yeah, but my timer is running. <laughs> <laughs> so why are we even looking at this? Um, because right now, if you watch that video, and I hope most of you have, 
is, is that what's out there is never going to fly. So we're limiting all the impacts on Alma. You're not losing any lanes. We're not touching the trees. We will bring whatever vegetation we took away back. Uh, we're avoiding utility relocations. And last slide's about costs. Next slide. So just getting more into what I just said. But the main thing, the way we're addressing the impact on Alma is we're moving the shoe flies to the outside, northbound, southbound tracks on the outside. And the way we avoiding the crease is essentially we reduce the tunnels to the size of urban tunnels, which um, ACOM didn't do. So all the siphons and the TBM pit and all that stuff, all that's gone. Next slide. So this is the first one. This is how we're avoiding all the impact on the utilities. We're basically flying over there because we don't start going down until we are about 200 feet north of Matadero. So we're just skimming over the uh, cover for Matadero. Next slide. And this is where the shoe flies are going to go. They're going to go on the outside. And we're leaving 10, 10 feet on Alma to um, have a, a park strip um, up south near San Antonio is more difficult. but. Next slide. So the ramps doesn't start there anymore. It's at least 600 feet uh, further south where the ramp starts. Next slide. OK, so it, it's going to start there, um, about 200 feet south of the creek. And we're just going to skim just over Madatero. Next slide. <coughs> so. That's the revised dimensions. I don't know if you can read. They have this 90 foot whatever. And OK, I'm going to show you the next slide. That's a national tunnel. The next slide. If anybody's ever taken the train between London and Paris, you went through there. And you went through there at 150 miles an hour. OK, next, next slide. Uh, now, Barron Creek, we're doing the same thing as they are. We're going underneath it. Next slide. We're not touching meadow. So basically, the shoe flies are going to go back like this, and they're going to go to a meadow. Next slide. Same with Charleston. We're not doing it, but right after Charleston, we've got to flare back out because we have got to uh, make room for the other portal coming from the south. Next slide. Uh, so OK, so this is where we're going to move it. We're moving to the other side of the creek. Next slide. So we're not touching the creek. We're not doing any of this stuff. No siphons. Next slide. And this is the way it's going to look. That's looking from uh, San Antonio South. So this is where the head walls and tunnels are going to move. Next slide. And the costs. These are costs that Deutsche Bahn just published for the High Speed Rail Authority. The closest that you want to look at is 2.61 miles for $125 million. Now, that was in the boonies. We're in Palo Alto. Maybe you have to double this. And that's it. Thank you. OK. Um, I think uh, Elizabeth Alexis, you have something. And then um, do you, are you going to connect the computer? In the meantime, Elizabeth, while you get set up, I'm going to let uh, Larry also has something he wanted to discuss. Well, what I'd like to add is just a, a, a sort of this, an alternative, not an alternative, but in addition to what uh, Mr. Price is suggesting, um, that is this goes back to um, the uh, original ideas studied by uh, Hatch Mott and McDonald back in 2014, and that is uh, just uh, doing an underpass, taking Churchill, making an underpass under the railroad tracks, uh, which does have the effect of taking certain amount of property. And I think that where we need to take a second look is uh, at are there alternatives to what Hatchmott was looking at that would reduce the amount of property that needed to be taken, uh, particularly by um, narrowing the road so there's still room for driveways, or alternatively, uh, taking a look at each driveway and saying, uh, uh, are there alternatives on those particular properties that would leave appropriate driveway access? Uh, with maybe some remuneration. Uh, the advantage of, the, of doing uh, what Hatchmott was studying, which is, uh, to repeat, uh, just an underpass uh, or, as an alternative to that, an underpass plus lowering Alma so you could still have turns, um, 
uh, uh, from Alma on to Churchill. Uh, the advantage is the old, very old-fashioned way that it's the very simple, uh, very straightforward. Um, Sorry, you're like my <laughs> Don't interrupt me. Yeah. Uh, um, I always like what Elizabeth has to suggest anyway. <laughs> uh, and I'm reminded of the old principle that is used in so many different fields of um, Occam's razor that uh, uh, quite frequently the best solution is the one that is the simplest and doesn't require as much uh, um, additional uh, alternatives or additions or whatever. So um, I would like to, uh, if nothing else, uh, for us to use that as a sort of our base model to see if we, um, how that works and if it doesn't work uh, uh, or what its cost is, um, how does that line up against other things uh, such as uh, um, Michael Price's suggestion and some of the, the other, and the roundabout that Tony has brought forth. Um, I think that uh, we have to constantly keep in mind what would be the, the easiest way to do it in, some, in a manner of ways. Okay, Elizabeth. Okay, wait. wait. Oh, you need a mic. And there's an S missing from the end of your name. <laughs> oh. All right. Oh, yeah. LXI. It's, there's actually two of us. Um, hi, I'm Elizabeth, and um, I always have lots of ideas, but this one I'm going to call a concept, and I am really, I'm good with numbers, but I'm really bad with drawing, so hopefully you can see what I'm doing. And Larry, I'm basically taking your idea. I'm, I'm looking mostly for Charleston Meadow. I think there are some reasons why I would maybe look at a different thing at... Um, the other, the other places in town. But yes, I think it's, it's really to revisit the under, underpass. And I'll go through why. I mean, I think both the options on the table, I mean, I love the idea of the tunnel, but um, it is very pricey. Maybe we can get it down with Roland's ideas, um, water impacts. It's very possible that that's not gonna, it's not gonna work. The hybrid is at a 2% design level, and I'm quite certain that it does not include detailed phasing and work window cost. Um, what we have learned over the last 10 years here around the world, everywhere, is that um, working on an operating railroad and a busy street, it is a different ball game. You cannot just take these numbers and um, the hybrid would especially, you know, it has, it has both road impacts and trade impacts. Right now, the work windows are extremely short. You spend a lot of time mobilizing. You work for like 10 minutes, they have to demobilize. They have very conservative work windows. And so you're, it's a multiple of everything you're doing. And then you add in the phasing. And that's only going to get worse as soon as electrification starts because there will be more trains. Um, the other thing, which is a different approach, which is even if, let's say, we get good a good price on both of these alternatives, we may not want them. So both the hybrid and the tunnel would effectively leave the intersection as it is, except with the impact of trains. Right? You just wouldn't have any trains there. We would. I would expect to see a significant amount of additional traffic on both of those intersections. I think one of the previous traffic consultants mentioned this, induced traffic. We've seen projects in Australia with Melbourne up 50%. So I think with what's going on at San Antonio and elsewhere, I don't think these roads could handle an extra 50%. So it's plus, it, we might want to think about not making it too nice for people. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, like nicer, but not too nice. Um, so I think we should revisit the road underpass concept. There were two variations looked at. One was you lower the whole intersection, and this is expensive and is just terrible for bicyclists and pedestrians. Um, then they looked at one where you just lowered Alma, but there were no turns available. It was um, no turns at all. Um, I went back and looked at this again, and one thing to note is it assumed two lanes in each direction, and then once you had two lanes in each direction, in addition, it assumed that Caltrain right now is, is sitting on the ground, but it would effectively have to be on a bridge if you went under it. It assumed this incredibly thick bridge. I have a picture of it here. If you look at that giant ch chunk there, it's assuming that under the road, it would just have to be that thick, but under the thing. So we had to go way underneath it. So if, you're going, if we're going back to here, um, let me go back to present. Um, you know, and then since you had all these thick things, then it was impacts to houses because the access issues, this very wide road. Um, it was going to be a fast road, so everything had, all the lanes had to be quite, quite wide. Elizabeth, you have about a minute and 45. All right, right. Well, go fast. Okay. So 
Charleston Road Stradero is actually only supposed to be one lane in each direction. There's a lot of extra lanes and space at the intersection for cars to wait and get through the lights. Um, and, but it's supposed to be designed as a very slow speed. We already have many short merges. It is possible to meet our traffic because we have signals kind of, you know, in all directions from that intersection. Here's my turns. On, we, sh we need to be able to do all turns. They should be safe. It should accommodate but not encourage turns. And we should minimize conflicts with bicyclists and pedestrians. The concept is this is that you'd have an eastbound and westbound single lane plus at a higher level a bike and ped driveway access from Alma for the homes on Charleston and you would allow the turns to happen by doing a U-turn. I'm going to try and just show you a picture of this. This is an intersection in Italy. This is one, it's not exactly the same because they don't, that intersection is not signalized so they've allowed the people who are tur driving north, just they just turn right there. The people who are going, who are kind of uh, westbound, they go to the intersection and they can turn right or left there. What I would do is instead of having one um, underpass in the middle is I would have two and then you would simply, um, then you'd, you would look like a call, it would look like it was uh, cul-de-sac. You, you have 30 seconds. She's talking okay. about the red dot for those of you who can't the see. Red on the red dot here, do you see this? So this is, now the question is how do you, how do you manage to do a turn if you're going the other way? And that's on this particular one, there's a roundabout here, whereas if you want to make, if you're coming under the underpass and you want to go north, let's say you go around, you go around the underpass, and then you go, you go back in north. Now, we're going at slower speeds, lower speeds. You can think about this. Right now, we could put something around right place. There oh, could be a loop. That's your time. All right, there's my time. <laughs> anyway, if people have more questions, this is the idea, is to take, take advantage of the fact that we did all this work to make Charleston a really small road, Thank and the you. previous designs did not include that. Thank you. Okay. All right. Is there anybody else who has a design iteration that we have not, who wanted to speak today? Okay. All right, I'll bring it back to XCAP members for discussion. Clarifying question about the rules, since unfortunately I missed the rules. I can't get here early than five on a second Wednesday. Um, is there any, like when, when we chime in, do we have the ability to ask staff, is there anything really glaringly obvious that someone who went to engineering school would say, like, let's not spend any time, or do we only want to have the XCAP members and not have the ability to ask any questions of staff? I think the idea, so uh, we voted previously to say it, it takes three XCAP members to support that idea moves to the next level of pre technical pre-screening, and that's where we didn't really allow for that in this iteration, so I guess the answer is no to that part of the question, okay, if that helps. Okay, thank you. You have answered the question. Right, sorry, three to discuss consen consensus to pass to the next level of screening. I apologize, there is correcting. Do we discuss before we vote three, or, or do we just go vote right now? If we should do that, then we should just vote for of the five, and then we discuss. Is that correct? Sure, that's fine. Is, is everyone comfortable with that? So the idea, the, just to, Dave, do you want to clarify again? Wait. So uh, Larry had said uh, a vote of three ha uh, qualifies a, a, a uh, option to be to move forward even from here. So we didn't say we would discuss that before we voted for three. So right now we're just all going to vote uh, for each one and see which ones uh, make three at least three votes, and then we'll discuss what which ones uh, emerge out of that vote. Does that sound right? Yep, Carrie. So do we need to make motions for this or will the chair go down the list and we vote whether we want to discuss Tony, Mike, Roland, Larry, and Elizabeth? I think that's probably the fastest way if that's okay with everybody, right? Because otherwise we'll be eaten up by the process monster. So no clarifying questions at all. So we just vote raw right from the... This this is just to get it, to, like, do you think it had enough merit or do you want to just kill it now? And so, and then if you have questions, vote yes, and then you can talk about it at the next thing, presumably. That's what I would. I, I, I would, well, 
I would encourage at least clarifying questions. Some people have spent a lot of time to prepare these ideas, and out of respect for them having done that, it would be, I think, appropriate to at least have some clarifying questions and uh, not just do it sort of raw the way it sounds like we're suggesting. I, I, I keep harping on this, this theme of being respectful of other ideas. Uh, okay, so so just to, 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 to think about that, the process we agreed on a few minutes ago had the discussion after the vote. It sounds like... I think that's the confusion was, is there, is there, is there at least I'm confused. Well, let me just put it on me. Okay. I did not think that when we voted, voted to take a vote of three to move it forward, that there would be, it would be sort of... Um, that kind of immediate, no discussion, no clarifying questions. You have a presentation which can get cut off, as it just did, and then you must vote. I didn't really think it was that abrupt. That's my and understanding, we and maybe I'm discuss. confused. So, who can maybe Larry? Can you or no, Judy? This is. I don't have any problem with clarifying questions, sure. except that clarifying questions sometimes turn into debates. Mm -hmm. uh, and th this is designed to be parallel to the usual <laughs> procedure that any government agency board follows. That is, that you've got to have somebody who's a, a champion, in this case three people who think this is worthy of the whole group's time. Uh, uh, but other than that, if anybody wants to... Uh, so uh, my, my concern is, are questions really questions and not debates? Mm -hmm. Good. Yes, I agree. Okay. I mean, and that that do, does sound like something that potentially moderators of the discussion can and help with. Like, without any discussion, I don't feel like I can vote on anything, and I think that a little bit of discussion might help me have some non-zero opinions, so. Keith and then Kerry. Yeah, I think some quick clarifying discussion would be fine. Uh, this is where the strong arm of the chairman could say, no, we're going to vote. Right. Fine. Carrie, did you want to have something? Um, I just, I'm, yeah, I'm also trying to understand the process, um, uh, like Judy. So forgive me, but I, I was kind of anticipating that the first vote was like making a motion, getting a second, but in our case, it's going to be a third. Right. Yeah. And then we have the discussion on the motion, and then we vote whether to refer it to council. Is that? Okay. Yep, that's right. It's a technical way. Okay. Does this mean, in effect, we need to revise the motion? Because it sounds like we're agreeing to go different. No. To me, again, I may be even more confused than Judy, but it sounds like we're revising the motion, the terms of the motion we passed not that long ago. But again, I'm confused. I, I have no, if you want to add clarifying questions, fine, if they're really clarifying questions. But let me give you a bad example. Uh, uh, if somebody came, today and proposed that we build a tunnel from border to border. Should we spend any time on that at all? At this point, probably not. Right. That's my, my point. So uh, that, that you got, you got to have some preliminary step. And what we've agreed to is got to have three people say, I think this is worthy of discussion. Okay. That makes sense. At some point, we just got to get going. Correct. Absolutely. Okay, so um, I'm going to take Chair's prerogative here and say I will allow a round of uh, any clarifying questions of the presentations that were made, and we will keep it to clarifying questions and not taking a position, and then we will take a, a vote to see of the five, I'm going to call them five concepts um, that are going forward, or the, of the five concepts presented, how many we want to then uh, uh, move to the next level of pre-screening. Okay, so clarifying questions, and then um, I'm going to ask... Uh, those who presented, well, Tony, you're already at the table. Uh, did Elizabeth leave? No, Elizabeth, uh, if you guys want Mike and Elizabeth and Roland, if you want to go by the mic so that if folks ask you a question, then you're there. Um, does anyone have a question for Tony since he's already seated? Judy. Um, I, I think where you were going with your presentation and your concept, Tony, and your group, um, was to sort of match the ethos of our community, the sort of the culture of our community. And I really like that. I, I think we have an opportunity 
it's very hard in municipal infrastructure to do things Sorry, that Judy, are. I'm going to ask you to limit it to a question. The, per question, <laughs> the question is, did you consider uh, using um, using Larry's uh, concept, which is simpler is better? Um, uh, is your concept um, sometimes simple isn't? Uh, appropriate if we can do something that actually adds to as an asset to the city. I guess that's my question. Th th thanks for asking that. I missed it in my presentation. Um, so the issue is this uh, proposal that staff has put on there is probably the least expensive but doesn't fit Palo Alto, right? So now how do you ask people for making their neighborhood a little bit worse but giving but funding it? So we need to, I think, make the neighborhood and the, and the solution much more acceptable for people to say, yes, I will fund that. And so that's the reason why the extra cost being, it's up to us to ask, is that extra cost of a viaduct worth a better neighborhood or are we willing to, to take the least expensive? Option. I'm not sure if I'm answering the question, but that's. And one follow-up question: When you designed this, start, uh, thought about this design, did you take into consideration, or is there has there been any consideration of the impact on town and country and in access through to um, to the west west side of this loop or whatever or the roundabout? Um, did you think about that, or did, or is it really just design? No, it's it's exactly what we thought about. We wanted more connections, and we thought the viaduct would make the professorville neighborhood more walkable, more bike friendly, and um, I think the walk score score will go up, which is added value, at least in today's market. Greg. Um, it looks like your design assumes a viaduct. Does your, design, does your design provide for the viaduct to land before it gets to Churchill? Or does adopting this design assume that we have to also cross Churchill with the viaduct? I think Keith can answer that question better because he's done the parabolas to look at the, the curves. Yeah, I don't have the numbers on top, but if we start at Churchill and, and ramp up, you can make it over um, the problem is that if you start curving, you know, when you get to the top of a bridge, as you start curving, you're not going up very much, but you're taking a lot of horizontal space. So if instead you go over uh, Embarcadero at grade and then come back down, you can make it. If you just go straight and curve, it, depending on the height, yeah. depending on the height, it's going to be nip and tuck. So part of the technical committee's job, if they were to review this, would be to answer that question. Correct. Yeah, so I, I think it's feasible, but it's not a slam dunk. And, and this also comes down to one of the things that Tony's been asking for is the, the vertical. How high do we have to go? And what, what's the existing ground? What's the elevation of that? I don't really understand the viaduct. Could you explain that again? Where does the viaduct start for this drawing and where does it end? Yeah, so, the, so the, on top of the, uh, <coughs> do you have the graphics? On, on top of the, yeah, you have the graphics there. There would be a viaduct that would be going over that on the existing rail line. The crossing at Churchill would remain, and just north of Churchill, the viaduct would start ramping up. Then it would cross over Embarcadero, and then north of that, it would go back down and it would hit before the Homer Tunnel. Okay, thank you. Where's your current proposal of where the viaduct starts on the other side? It sounds a little bit like we're not completely sure yet, is what it's, the answer sounded like to me. I, I, folks, you see, it seems like you're making a really solid case that we should discuss this. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you. Yes. So, yes. Uh, so the point is, there is this is a design concept. It is not an engineering vetted thing. So if there's this much interest, perhaps the group seems to be inclined towards maybe some design, further design review could happen. Adina, yes. Uh, clarifying question. So, um, with um, so is this is is this associated with an option that would close Churchill to cars and then would transform 
the Embarcadero intersection in order to be able to have the, the cross connectivity. Do I understand this correctly? That's correct. Great. Um, and so um, one of the questions which like f for the further analysis would be um, if we have funding for a grade separation treatment at Churchill, um, is that going to be interpreted that we can use the money to um, uh, handle the consequences by doing a so, Adina, roadway change? I'm gonna so myself, this is obviously not something we're going to answer here, but that is one of my uh, Okay, so just, um, I think we're gonna try to keep it to technical questions because we don't wanna argue positions on different things. So the really, again, we're gonna focus on, do you have a technical question on the presentation so we can then move to decide whether or not we wanna get this reviewed, so. We're having a discussion right now. Drew, uh, yeah. You just yeah. voted not to yeah. have yeah. it. Okay. Violating what it, you just did Thank you, I got it. <laughs> Keith, did you have something? No. Dave? A uh, question about Mike Price's um, concept. Uh, could you put it up real quick? Or? Mike, you can take the mic. <laughs> so uh, can you pull up the very first diagram, I think? It was a shot of down Churchill. Uh, uh, up, uh, next one, sorry. Um, yeah, yeah, sorry, Sh looking down almost fine. That, Chantal, yeah, that's the one. So uh, you didn't mark traffic lights, but I'm assuming there's one at the bottom of Alma, at the intersection of Churchill. Yes. Is there any um, light or control for traffic on that, where the, the people cross over, ped and bike cross over, on that little piece of road that goes up to meet Churchill on the other side? Yeah, there would need to be some kind of a light there for, for pedestrian crossing, at least. And again, this would go through design review by presumably traffic right. folks. What about the traffic lights on their path? turning left to Churchill from Arma. Yeah, I would assume there's a left turn light there too. So there is a light under the... Light in the intersection for left turn. So to clarify, he said there's two signals, one underneath the for the folks that have gone <laughs> down on the Churchill side, and then also one on the surface up on the road that's staying at grade on the east side. Right. Anybody else? And there is enough room to have all these 50 feet, 60 feet you mentioned earlier. This would have to be analyzed. That this no, is right now there's six lanes on South Mountain Alma, and I've eliminated one of them. And yeah. you know, it's actually, it could be narrower than that, but it's, so there's only five lanes here now. Okay. Any other clarifying questions? Okay. All right, so we'll bring it back to the group. Um, so no, d does anyone have any clarifying questions for either Elizabeth or for Roland? I have some oh, okay, we've got Phil for whom? Okay. So I can get them at the mic. For Roland. Roland, can you go to the mic? <coughs> yeah. So, uh, by the way, I found the, I'd like to say I found the analysis very interesting. Uh, first question is, to what extent has your now, does your uh, concept either change or fill in the gaps on what AECOM has done so far? So, Chantal, can we go back to the first? Yes, I don't have the Right at the beginning. Okay. Is that your question? Okay. Well, no, I appreciate that, but you, you've shown some work, mm -hmm. and you're saying let's move let's move the tunnel entrances, for example. Mm -hmm. And that's based on your own analysis, not what yeah, not what AECOM has done. Okay. It's, it's based on my experience over the last 10 years studying what's been done in London. Right, okay, so that's question one. Question mm -hmm. two, mm -hmm. why should the Deutsche Bahn cost be relevant in this context? I'm just giving you an example, and actually I thought about it further. I really regret it not showing you the cost of London tunnels that most of you have taken. But that particular ramp I showed you was part of a, the, uh, of a six mile tunnel, and it was $250 million. Okay. The I tunnel goes road through that tunnel. Right, it goes, it goes, that ramp and the tunnel go all the way to Stratford International. 
Now, can I ask you a question? No, nope, I'm going to limit oh, that. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> no, I'm just wondering if this gentleman actually works for ACOM, but anyway. No. No, he does not no, work I for ACOM. Work. No. Okay. He, um, okay. And I'm going to have you sit down. Thank okay. you, Roland. That's it? Yeah. Um, do we have... Do we have any more clarifying questions? Okay. Yeah, does anybody have a question for Elizabeth? Okay. Um, sorry. Um, what are you actually proposing? It seems like fewer lanes. Could you quickly reiterate, like, how many lanes go where? Um, so I'm yes. Microphone, Elizabeth. So what I'm proposing is to go back to kind of a variation on the hatch mod of um, of an underpass that would that would not have where you're not sinking um, Alma, so you'd basically be grade separating um, Charleston and Meadow under under Alma, and I would say that you'd have one travel lane in each direction, along with bike and ped, and that you would leave at the surface um, the turns from from the east side of Charleston right at the surface, and that you would accommodate the turns from the west side of Charleston onto Alma by basically having people go go through and then you turn and then go back and do those turns. That makes sense. And the one thing that's a little bit different than the Italian one is the Italian one because the road that was parallel to um, to the train tracks was sort of a minor road that didn't, there wasn't a, um, like a traffic light there, so they were, they, they took the two, the, the east and west lanes and put them together, which is what you think doing. I'm actually suggesting separating those so that you can, for the traffic light, then that means your, your lane onto Charleston and probably your two onto Alma are, um, you, they, you can put those together and have a nice small traffic light. And it also allows you on the pedestrian side that you don't have, you're, you're not interacting with any cars. So you'd be able to go straight through. It's, it's much better from a ped perspective. Dina, and then two, Carrie. Two clarifying questions. One is which turning movements are removed in this option? None. Okay, all, all the turning movements. Uh, no, uh, at Alma, they're 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 no, not. They're all they all remain. They just are done a little differently. I guess the question is which of them, the direct turns are eliminated. But I mean, I think that what I'm trying to say is different about this is that. We left a lot of turns like Embarcadero. Technically, they remain, but they're unsafe turns because you're, you're making unsignalized left turns across multiple lanes. The kinds of turns you would make here, this is a standard kind of thing where you go and you make the U-turn, and it would be at a small roundabout, I think at a very low speed roundabout. These would be safe signalized turns onto Alma for all turn movements. Just to clarify, because it's very difficult because your, yours is the only one that doesn't have an image here also, so that nobody can see. Um, the general concept, as I understood it, is that if you're on the El Camino side of the train and you're on Charleston or Meadow, you are going under. You would no longer be able to turn directly left or right onto Alma. You would go under all the way through to the other side, meaning the east side of Alma, and in the neighborhood area, fit a traffic circle in one of the intersections. It's near, um, there, there's an existing, I think it's, what did I say, Carlson? Um, there's an existing Hold on, street. Let, let right me there. finish explaining. And so you'd go to the intersection on the other side, and then you'd be you'd turn back around to be able to take Alma. And the idea, I believe, is being that um, if you make it really easy for cars to turn left and right onto Alma and and keep all of the throughput, then you're inducing a lot more traffic. This causes more people to be. To you know, to to potentially use El Camino or other roads, if I understood it correctly. Right. So right now, I mean, looking at the traffic analysis, part of this is driven by looking at who's making turns there and why they're making them, and they're not generally local turns. They're people who could be turning onto El Camino at San Antonio or further away. Um, they're people like me who um, live in Green Meadow, and so like right now, I go out on Alma. I'll go. I'll make the left turn, but I could very easily come out at Nelson and then just go straight through. So I mean. This is one thing I think from the studies that we've done on traffic and all these projects, e even the ones here, like do not underestimate induced traffic and do not also understand, you know, like people will find other ways around, but you want safe turns, which right now don't exist at um, Embarcadero or really even university. Great, thank you. Phil? Just a very quick question. Oh, uh, sorry, I, I missed Carrie, Phil, actually. It, uh, let me let Carrie go oh, and I'm I'll sorry. let you go. Thank you. Um, uh, just just to, to clarify, because I'm not sure I totally understand, 
when you talk about reducing the road width, you're talking about stacking lanes on Meadow and Charleston? Um, or are you talking about so reducing right the width So right now, let me just, um, I don't know. And so right now on at the intersection, and do we have a picture someplace just of the intersection of Charleston? Can we just pull that up someplace? Just maps, just pull it up. So right now we have um, on Alma northbound, we have, for example, two left-hand turn lanes so that cars can sit. And the only reason we have two left-hand turn lanes is that, is that we know we have short windows to get everybody through, so you have to sit there and we stack all the cars and then we hope we can get them through between trains. And then we also have additional, um, the only reason it's more than one lane in each direction on Charleston right now is, is to uh, try and get people through quickly I, at the, the light. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I just wanted to, to clarify which roads are gonna be altered in terms of width. So you're talking about left turn lanes? Well, right now, most of Charleston is only one lane each direction. Yep, I get it. So and the still train be, track, there's four. You're talking right, and about you'd only need, that, right? you only need one through there if you don't have to sit and stack them. I mean, right. it's one the of the problems the, with Charleston. To answer Carrie's question, it's Meadow and Charleston that Thank would you. no longer, that would be narrowed at the, at the right, exact Right, tracks. but I'm just trying to say, like, it's been a problem that we haven't been right. able to Elizabeth, narrow them on I that stretch. I wanted to clarify because Just I clarifying questions, yeah. people. We've gone away afield again. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. Clip fill, question. and then if you aren't improving the rest of the overall uh, approaches to the intersections, uh, why do you suppose that you will still get a lot of induced traffic? Well, because right now people avoid it because of the train, but people still like it better than any of the other intersections because it's the most normal. People don't like making curly cues at San Antonio. People hate um, Oregon. They hate those, so they really like these things where they feel like they're going directly. Okay. All right. Okay, thank, thank you. you. I know, I'm not good at judging clarifying questions, I apologize. Um, okay, so we are now going to um, take a vote. And uh, so for the sake of, do you wanna, do you have a starting motion? I don't think we need motions. I think that you ought to go through each of the five presentations and see whether there are three okay. people who support it. And then if we have whatever ones get three votes, then we'll bring those back for discussion. Great. So do we have three people who want to vote to look more closely at Mike Price's idea? Raise your hand. Great. That passes. Um, we don't need an exact number for the record, right? No. There's more than three. How's that? Um, uh, do we have more than three people interested in exploring Tony Carrasco's idea of um, Embarcadero in a traffic circle? Three or more. Sorry. Um, great. Uh, do we have more than three people interested in, on, in Roland's uh, idea of the South Palo Alto Tunnel? And uh, do we have more than three people interested in Larry's iterations on the original Hatchmott study to look at lowering the road underneath the tracks? Um, yeah. Right? Three. One, two, three. Okay. <laughs> Okay, and last, do we have interest in Elizabeth Alexis's concept for um, having roundabouts on the east side of the tracks, or at least the concept of trying to control traffic and have less traffic? Okay, all right, everybody makes it. <laughs> Larry, do you have? Okay, great. So um, the motion then now is uh, to have all five ideas then be re reviewed by the technical working group and the civils, um, and then come back with that report for the XCAP at the next meeting. Uh, yes, Judy? Um, what, what is the scope and scale of what you call technical review? Because for example, any of these that impact Embarcadero and town and country, is that, is that something that's part of what we're asking them to look at or is that for yet another conversation? Are we looking really just at engineering or are we looking at other what else are we looking at? Good question. Larry, you had a no, 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 so. <laughs> well, we passed said that we would now discuss uh, each of these five ideas and indeed incorporating some of the so-called clarifying questions uh, and see whether the, the, any of the five or all of the five or three or four out of the five got a consensus support out of this group to move forward to the technical committee. Do you have an answer for what Judy's, or do we have a thought on what Judy's saying? Uh, as far as I was concerned, the I'm not a the technical com committee person, but I, I, I would think they're just uh, uh, to review whether these are technically feasible 
and I know engineers say with enough money you can do anything, but uh, of uh, uh, the idea here is, uh, I mean, Keith referred to uh, the, the curve and the, the bridge and felt that it was just barely uh, feasible. Uh, uh, maybe more review, uh, yeah. the technical people would come back and say, Either it is or it isn't. If they said yeah, it isn't, we then would scrub it to give a more definitive answer. To Correct. That. So yeah. that's the, w the way yeah. I saw that. So yeah. the level of review is: does it violate the laws of physics? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the bad things is that we're not going to look at traffic, and that actually is a, a player in a lot of these. But that's mm -hmm. that's that. Adina. Yeah, um, so the light bulb that I had on. Elizabeth. Can you move closer to your mic? Yeah. They're asking. Um, the light bulb that I had on. Elizabeth's idea is the concern that doing just a straight grade separation might induce car traffic and therefore additional treatments would be needed to um, you know, calm cars and improve safety. And that was an extremely persuasive point. But the engineering solution proposed, I have a lot more questions about. And so I, I would love to see other ideas about avoiding the induced traffic, um, like not only that one, because that, that, that core idea was a really important one, I think. I think to Keith's point, if I think about this, I don't, because we have only civil engineers that have um, volunteered, we don't have the expertise, at least in our group, to actually discuss whether the traffic calming treatments, to call them that, are would actually, mm -hmm. Right, but I, I think even e even even if it doesn't pass the this is a physically possible way to do that, um, I think that was a good insight to put in here in terms of recommendations. Um, like even if that doesn't survive, thinking about how to deal with the induced traffic impacts of a nice grade separation that encourages people to drive through. Okay, Carrie, go ahead what Larry said. Okay, great. So we're going to discuss them one at a time. And that way we'll and then we'll do the final vote. It's our, vote on each one as it comes along. Okay. I'm just, what about I'm, our agenda timeline? So we have we're we're skipping uh, thank you for that. We are uh, skipping item number uh, 6 today. We're going to do that at the next one. And then we'll have uh, we do have working groups um, an update and then uh, member updates, which we'll have to sort of, we'll, we'll take quickly. So. Yeah. Item five is what we're doing. Oh, the problem statement. Yes, we're going to have to. I think we're not going to have time for that for sure. Um, uh, so we'll skip five and six today, unfortunately. Um, hopefully you guys will get a chance to read that. Okay. Larry, you know what? I'm going to let you drive this piece so that it goes as expeditiously as possible. I'm serious. I, I'm going to let you do it. Okay, let's uh, go in order of, um, um, well, which one, which one should we take first? Let's take um, uh, Mike Price's idea first. Discussion on whether we think it's to move forward. Dave, you're moving around. I'm moving. Um, I think there's some real brilliance in that idea. There's some really cool things. My main concern about that particular concept is that short stretch of Churchill is going to be overloaded with cars very quickly. As Elizabeth mentioned, it draws 50% traffic, any kind of underpass. And if, that, if there's 50% more traffic being drawn to that little piece of road, that's going to be devastating to everybody living on that street, including people trying to get out of it. So. Uh, us on the other side, I think, would jump for joy maybe in some ways. Uh, there could be some issues on um, the loss of a protected left turn that may come up, um, not sure. But it seems to me that one of the things that we're looking at is trying to keep a lot of traffic out of our neighborhood roads, that this would defeat that, given that that little piece of Churchill in Southgate is a neighborhood road. It's only one lane each way, and it's not it's barely supporting any traffic that's uh, on it right now. So that would be my main concern about his, his concept. Okay. Others? 
my concern and one I'd like the technical committee to look into if they do um, is the feasibility. Um, we're basically a, a bunch of professional engineers made a bunch of assumptions and city council didn't like them. So we're saying, ah, but different assumptions, it might work. It seems like a very creative geographical idea, but I haven't, the diagrams there, I don't know if they're wishful thinking or if they're, you know, as Tony mentioned earlier, to the inch actually possible. Um, so if, if they can come back and say, yes, this is actually possible, then it's a very, very interesting idea, but I can't tell from the diagrams. And then the questions about traffic will continue. Okay, others, Tony. My concern is: are there takings, or is how long does the construction period last, and what's the disruption? Maybe I just put a, one clarification here. What, our next vote is just uh, to say to uh, that that we think this idea is worthy enough to ask other people, volunteers, AECOM to give further thought to it. It's by no means final in any sense, no, no way that we're endorsing anything. It's just, are we saying that this is worthwhile enough to go forward? I would love to have an opportunity to, if we decide that something is worth going forward, and I thought that's what we did before, yeah. but <laughs> to um, ask questions that ought to be answered before we can move any further, <laughs> you know, so my question is, is this even possible, and that's fine. That's fine. I guess I would like to see some sort of quick analysis that says relative to the current plans, what are the incremental costs, what are the incremental t construction times, and what are the overall traffic impacts? So what are we getting for our money? That's the, the basic question I'd like to see. Answered. I don't think we're going to get that from our technical committee over the weekend, though. No. No. <laughs> uh, well, all right. Oh, you're absolutely right. That we actually absolutely need that eventually. I completely agree. All right. Okay. Fair. Fair comment. Okay, Keith. Um, I really think we should be looking at this for no other reason than we don't have a lot of options at Churchill. Right now, we either have a closure or a hideous viaduct. You know, and so your either one of those has its flaws, and this at least is a third option to to, uh, to look at. Yeah, I would completely agree with that. Viaduct. It's not great no matter how you paint it. Okay. Uh, no. Okay. So, young? Yeah, I have a comment. So, okay, so the Tony's idea, there is a Vidoc in it, but it's not. I think we're going to take one at a time. So, okay, we're going to so take yeah, mics. Tony's idea, the Vidoc is not in the uh, next residential. It's actually the the it's a commercial and also school, right? So is that Viaduct, I don't mind it, right? Because although I, I think Viaduct is really bad, but I think because it's less intrusive because yeah, no, it's not right next to the house. In Young, yeah. we're, we're, we're just focusing on Mike Price's idea. Okay, okay, oh, Mike Price? Yeah. Okay. What? Mike Price, okay, I'm mixing those two. No, no, so, we're gonna, we're gonna so can isolate we, them. Okay, so I seen this kind of drawings in Montreal because I live in Montreal. <laughs> they have this underpass thing, and the, the only problem concern I have is the um, the road underneath. They are not very very well used. Like for example, the um, the the road that um, facing west of Churchill that is making um, the 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 access to the the west east of Churchill, and so I'm just wondering if you know we're using our road properly. Right, so that's one of my concerns, but need to be studied, right? But I seen some of similar concepts, and then the roads behind it wasn't very well used. So, and I I like the idea because it's not the car centric. It's not you know it has also have a pedestrian and bike centric. Another concern I have is I think if there is a two lane traffic on Churchill that is high speed more traffic, I think it's safety of children is in jeopardy. Okay. All right. Well, keep in mind that we're going to talk about the other two Churchill ideas um, after this one, the other ones being um, Tony's roundabout or semi-roundabout. And uh, what I suggested, that we go back to what Hatchmott discussed about just doing a simple underpass uh, at Churchill. Uh, but let, let's, I think we're almost ready to vote on whether we want to go forward with Mike Price's idea. Are there more comments on that? 
All right, let, let's have a show of hands rather than a vote uh, as, as to how many people are willing to have Mike Price's idea go forward to the Technical Committee. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, way over any number. So we we're going forward with uh, his idea. Let's go to Tony's, uh, excuse me, go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to chime in on Tony's. I have to run to another meeting. Ah, okay. Well, uh, so I wanted to be the first well, hand up. Okay, <laughs> you succeeded. Um, thank you. So I really like Tony's uh, and the team's proposal that uh, was designed with roundabouts. I don't know um, which of the two is best. I do think it would be useful to have the technical committee take a look at that. Um, but what I like about it is that uh, that area is a problematic intersection already. It needs to be addressed. I think finding a way to address it in a way that is complementary um, and even you know helpful to the rail project would be extremely valuable. And I think it would solve a lot of the problems that could come up um, in the future when the rail is complete. So I think it's very important to think about ways to, to do this. And um, I apologize, I have to leave, but just wanted to weigh in. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if I could speak to Tony's as well. So I um, support the idea. I, I certainly looked at the idea. And the concept is what we saw in the traffic studies is that um, going north-south on Alma is part of the problem. And just putting a viaduct at Churchill doesn't really solve the problems of the debarcadero. And the traffic mitigations also seem complicated. So I would certainly support having a full review of that concept. I, I'm a little concerned about scope creep if we're going to address this, but we're not closing Churchill. Our, 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 our remit is to spend the town's money that we actually don't actually have yet on grade separation, and we're saying, well, as part of grade separation, let's make Embarcadero nicer. Um, so I'm I, certainly, I, this looks like a very creative idea. I'm just a little skeptical that it's sort of getting a little bit out of our jurisdiction and um, well, uh, again, I'm. Uh, this is an. Uh, I like the idea to be uh, further reviewed. Um, again, I think when we have an opportunity to add an asset, a, uh, a streetscape asset to a neighborhood, and also an entryway to an important commercial area, and also a gateway to Stanford, this is a different intersection, and it doesn't particularly work well now. Um, and so I. I think um, it's really worthy of looking at. Um, I go back in time to when we were talking about other uh, rotaries or roundabouts, whatever, rotaries back east where I'm from, um, and we looked at, uh, this was when there were suggestions to do that on all of Embarcadero, all the way down to uh, 101. Um, there were a lot of concerns about kids on bikes not having a street light to actually stop the traffic so they can get around. Um, but um, we studied the ones in, I think, Boulder is where I think I'm recalling. The ones we studied at that time were Boulder. Uh, ultimately, we didn't decide to do any of that for some other reasons I won't go into now. Uh, but uh, it is a, a traffic engineering modern way to move traffic, hopefully in a safe way. And so I, I think it's really worthy um, of a further examination, and I support that. Dave? Yeah, echoing uh, Judy's comments, I thought she put it pretty eloquently. I think I love the, the idea of it um, being a really good reflection of Palo Alto. But also, um, to Greg's point, I think that uh, Embarcadero mitigation has got to happen, regardless whether or not Churchill uh, happens or not. Um, and also, one thing that uh, I, I'm not sure if I'm, gonna, I'm supposed to bring up, but I'll say this. Uh, at the community meeting, the consultants actually showed a draft document of a traffic analysis of the mitigations at Embarcadero. And it showed an amazing increase in levels of service from F to like A's and B's. So it, this report I'm hoping will come out soon. I was hoping it would come out maybe today. But um, there's some pretty interesting stuff that's in there. And uh, if that's true, then um, and that's against closing Churchill, by the way, too. So if we do the, and it doesn't really matter what kind of mitigations we do in Embarcadero, as long as we preserve all the turns in all directions, then this is going to happen. And it's going to be great for traffic everywhere. Okay, so that's why, you know, it's, it's worthwhile to, to look at all these solutions at Embarcadero. 
Any negative comments? Anybody who doesn't think we ought to go forward with studying? Uh, uh, this is not a negative comment. This is about what are we learning from this exercise? Because I think there's more than one thing that we can learn from this exercise, and one of them is have have has this identified one or more options that really should get the full-on treatment study. And then there's another type of learning from my background as a software product manager, which is that when somebody has an idea for a product feature, sometimes they're making an awesome suggestion for a product feature, and sometimes they've identified a problem that is a real problem. And even while the suggestion like isn't actually a reasonable suggestion, but it sheds new light on um, a problem. And in this case, and, and I would like us to capture those things regardless of the fate of the technical analysis. And on this one, I think the problem is that the proposed traffic mitigations of Embarcadero um, don't feel satisfying in terms of how it really fits with um, multimodal cross town connectivity and like what you had just said actually causes me more worry because if it makes the level of service to a and makes it like really like a freeway for drivers um, that may not meet the needs of the other kinds of travel that we have in that area and I think that the thing on the table doesn't address all the goals for travel through the area whether or not this is a solution that moves forward or not so want to but have a way to capture what requirement that that these things elucidate, whether or not this particular idea moves forward. I, I would note, since we don't have this mm -hmm. miraculous traffic, traffic study with, 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 with the, sorry, uh, since we don't have this study, we really shouldn't be referring to it since we don't know what it really says. Uh, I'll be really intrigued by it if it shows a level of, of A at uh, El Camino. Um, Okay, further comments on Tony's proposal? I would just like to say I think Tony did address something very important that we don't talk about, and that is aesthetics. Um, we live here. This is our home. And unfortunately, the train, the Caltrain rail, um, cuts through our city. And so being able to address how to make this um, redesign more acceptable to a lot of people, especially when we look at financing eventually. I think it's very important that people understand that we did consider um, environmental as well as social aspects of the travel, um, as well as <coughs> how we will live with this design every day. So thank you, Tony. Okay, I think we're ready to take a, I think we're ready to take a vote. Uh, all those in favor of forwarding Tony's proposal on to the next level. I think it's uh, all but, Adina didn't put up her hand. Mm -hmm. Oh, she did. <laughs> Just okay. tiredly. Okay. Um, <laughs> let's move on to what I refer to as uh, sort of the base case as to whether we really want to consider that again. Uh, and that is what I suggested, to go back to the Hatchmott proposal of 2014, which is uh, just to create an underpass at Churchill, leaving obviously Churchill open uh, and either uh, keeping Alma at its present level or reducing it so that if you wanted to make a turn, you could, but if you keep it at the higher level, you can't. Uh, so uh, that had a limited amount of support when we threw it out, but uh, further discussion. Larry, doesn't it also include doing the same for Meadow and Charleston? No, I, that, that's, that's Elizabeth's. Okay. We'll get to that. I'm we still, keep, I was keeping all the Churchill like, ones I, all together. I'm, I'm still confused about, can you give another description of what goes up and what, where you can turn and? No, you, if, if you just go down, that's why it's the simplest one. If you okay, just, Alma goes down or? No, Churchill goes Ch down. Churchill uh, goes down and goes under the tracks. Under the tracks and, and, and under Alma. And but, under Al Alma. Right, that's 1A. 1B is that you bring Alma down and uh, to, to allow turns there. So at the, they're, they're, they, they mesh. Churchill and Alma, but they're both below the, the railroad tracks at that point. To, to clarify, because mm -hmm. not everyone maybe knows the Hatchmott study, um, the mo that study was done when high-speed rail was still uh, a possibility, and so part of the emphasis of the study was just to show if you took exactly how wide the road is today and you lowered it on both sides, 
it, that it would have property impacts. What the study never did was attempt to lower the road and save and protect as many property impacts as possible because it wasn't designed to do that at the time. And so the question is, is there a way to look at that again and mitigate, you know, and it, it might be shifting the road over closer to the Pali side so that you're not impacting the homes on, on Churchill along the east side and Southgate. You know, th there might be iterations, but, but what could you do to, to protect as much as possible? Could you make it only one lane in each direction? That's sort of the concept. Narrow the lanes also to, again, make right. the, so you don't have to close off the drivers. But a significant portion of the cost of taking properties would have been because of the driveway situation. And are there ways to mitigate that? And it seems to me they never addressed that. And never and it seems almost, to me anyway, uh, bad practice for us to ignore a very simple solution because it wasn't done adequately as to what ways are there to mitigate the takings of property. So if there'd be a driveway, for example, you might be able to access it from a side street as opposed to mm -hmm. right directly off Correct. Home. Correct. Correct. Okay. One other thing I just clarified. They, so they didn't attempt to save any properties. Um, I would also say that um, politically, um, the reason that Mountain View and Sunnyvale are, are further along, quote unquote, than Palo Alto is because they are not touching their train tracks. They're only touching roads. And everything we've looked at has been touching the tracks and moving them in any way, which in involves shoe fly tracks, and that's why it gets so expensive. So this iteration is simply trying to look at something where you still lower the road but protect properties, which was never actually right. looked at. And just to make it clear, we're, we're not, this proposal wouldn't touch the tracks at all. So uh, it may be a very cost-effective way. Yeah. Don't know, but I, I think that even if it doesn't succeed, it gives us a, a baseline. Uh, and I think Adina's point was really an interesting one. That is that sometimes that, uh, uh, a proposal really points to other solutions rather than, or tests them, rather than being the solution itself. We'll get back. I'm not we'll sitting way down here <coughs> next time. <laughs> no, we'll, 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 we'll get to everybody. Larry, Judy, yeah, I'm going to be right across. I'm going to be right next to Larry. Um, uh, my question. Yeah, I'd love sitting here. Sorry. Um, my question actually was about because I don't know about that study from way back. But my question really was, in any in any iteration of your proposal or this design concept, is there a taking of commercial or residential property? Not commercial, but res there, okay. there may very well, well be. Well, I meant city. Yeah. I think there's some city. There's no city property there. Okay, uh, is there any, it can, is the concept, you said that that wasn't even looked at last time? No, it, it was looked at. Uh, Hashmut, hash whatever. <laughs> the, they, hash were, they, were, they were the predecessor to AECOM. Okay, but not, I can't not, pronounce your Not name. legally, but, the, uh, but uh, so, we had a different consultant back then. Okay, I get, I get that. My, my, to be very clear what my question was, though, <clears throat> is there, in that concept, you've said they didn't look at whether there would be any property taking. No, they, they did. No, no. They did look. And yeah. was there property taking? There, they, they, they looked at a very high level with the worst assumptions that had terrible property impacts. The question on the table is to, is it, possible to do a secondary, no, it's okay, Elizabeth. No, no, no. To do a secondary review, this time trying to avoid as many property impacts as possible. And we, the answer is we don't know if you could avoid them completely or you could only avoid, you know, impact one or two and that might be rejiggering someone's driveway. That's the question. That's exactly why it needs to go to analysis because it was never fully analyzed in that way. And we would be directing the analysis to look at the, at the, Op opportunity to have no property taking, no property impact, as well as some. Is that right? I, th <clears throat> I think we'd say, what, what is the impact? Design this in a way, at least on a conceptual that level, have that have, would no have the minimal amount of property takings. If at all. Yeah. Well, it's Im okay, I just want to be sure that the question would be posed, can it be designed with no property impact? That's, well, that's, that, that's the same thing as minimal. Uh, no. no, it, well, you the, the, have an the city has not said there will be no property takings. That's why I asked the question. Yeah, no, th that is not a policy of the city. Several council members from time to time have said they don't want to have any property well, takings, but it may not be a possibility. Whether, regardless of whether it's a policy of the city, I think, at least for me, it's important to know whether there could be designed without any, not minimal, but without any property taking. Well, I'm not debating it. Yeah, that, that's, that's not part of the motion. 
or that, that part of what I was suggesting anyway, because I don't think it's totally realistic. I think there's a difference between a taking and an impact. So you could impact two feet of someone's driveway, and that's still considered a property impact. There's a difference between that and a full taking of an entire property. And so the question, the reason that Blair is being specific about the words is if you say no property impacts, you can't even move someone's driveway. And so there's a range, and that would be exactly what we'd have to come back with. Like, is it just driveways, or is it full homes? And as long as it's examined that way, that would be good. Thank you. Adina. Um, are there any turning movements that are allowed now that go away in this idea? Yes, there would be. If, if you take the idea of just running Al, um, Churchill under uh, Alma and the railroad tracks, uh, there would be no... And you don't turn... You can't turn uh, left and right from, uh, uh, from Alma onto... Uh, Churchill. Okay, so the other uh, clarifying question. But but that but 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 a <laughs> alternative from the Hatchbot was to do to do the same thing with regard to Churchill, running it under, but also lowering Alma as it comes into Churchill, so that you could then turn. They they would be at the same level. I think it, and you can go straight. Okay. Like previously. Oh, you'd always go, be able to go straight. Right. right. Um, right so now. the other question is: Is the technical team looking at um, is the outcome um, ADA compliant? Does that meet standards for people walking and, and biking, which it, um, can be an issue in some of the um, older underpasses that precede ADA and aren't ADA compliant? So is that one of the, th one of the high level outputs that the technical screen will find? I don't know the answer to that. What do you think, Ed? Well, it's certainly an issue. Yeah, it yeah. Be yeah. Um, it's, it's not unlike what exists at Embarcadero today, where you can have the bike peds at a different level. They sit higher up than the road. So the question would be posed, is this possible? And if, and if so, what does it mean for bike peds and what happens? I mean, that's, I think all of those would be fair to ask, keeping in mind that these are volunteer civil engineers plus our working group who are just kind of looking at the does this pass the physics test to then move to the next level. Yeah, a, a way to look, I, I, I tend to think that they won't reach that level. Um, but th this is, we're proceeding on a sort of a, the way the engineers look at it, 2% level, 4% level, 10% level. Uh, we've been, when we made our first cut as to which ones we even talk about, we were at the 0 0.05 level, maybe now we're at the 1 or 2% level. The uh, the technical working group that we're referring to will get us to, let's say, 3 or 4% or 5%. That's the idea. Further comments on, on um, this, David? So I've been um, you know, attending city council for about two years on this issue. And um, I haven't seen city council members be amenable to any property takings at all. And that's why the, the original uh, hybrids were removed. Uh, the hybrid itself was actually a response to something you were asking right now, was to see if there was a minimizing that could be happening if we raised the rail a little bit and lowered the road a little bit, uh, not as much. So, but that still resulted in properties taking. Now, they got rid of that because they didn't want to deal with eminent domain and all that. Then the other thing is Churchill is unique in that the road is so narrow there. It's only one lane each way and maybe with a bike lane. If you were trying to fit something like a, you could fit maybe a single lane, like you could take that concept of the uh, bike, you know, uh, underpass that kind of goes under and made it into a car lane, but then there would be no room for bike and ped to, to go down there. I mean, you'd be encroaching on the roads on either side to do that. And that would, to, to do it for a road, you'd have to take the whole entire length of Churchill, uh, one block in either direction to do that. So I, I don't really see how, they could come up with anything that would that would be a solution to this, quite frankly. Well, could could be. Uh, I do want to address the eminent domain question because I did bring that up to the city council when what's the date when they set up the principles that we're uh, operating under right now. Uh, we had quite a dialogue that night, and I mentioned to them uh, what their feeling was about uh, uh, the need to take properties. And the, the the easy example is. Uh, uh, would you support a proposal that required the taking of total taking? Remember, you can have partial takings too. 
the total taking of the property um, worth three million, in sort of your average Palo Alto property these days, uh, if it saved the city a hundred million dollars. And of course, everybody on the council said, oh yeah. They, they didn't make a motion on it, but uh, they got no negative reactions because how could they turn that down? How, if you, in the hypothetical. Okay, so once you say we're willing to, to take one house to save $100 million, what about two houses, what, and so on and so forth. Uh, if you set up an absolute, I think that the, 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 the city council would have a problem uh, in selling a tax measure to the public. Uh, if it became known that there was an alternative which the council turned down which, where they could have saved $100 million by taking one or two houses. So it's a, like a lot of absolutes, it really has some problems to it. Tony? So uh, to answer Judy's question, that Hatchmott McDonald study did show a lot of takings. On the other hand, I've not seen someone whose house has been taken complaining a lot. So, so there may be some newspaper ones who go out there and, and talk about how they were not compensated enough in their opinion, but in general, I think they're happy. Well, I was at the council meeting where there were some very different opinions stated, including one that got me crying, a lot of people, a Vietnam uh, refugee. And so um, I'm not sure everybody agrees they'd be happy. No, no, no. Not everyone. Oh, not everyone. Okay. Adina. Uh, um, so I am not at all confident that the people doing math will come out and wind up saying that this is feasible. But I think the thing that this tests is did um, Hatch Mott McDonald actually miss something? And if that's a creeping doubt and that doubt can be put to rest, I think it's worthwhile just as answering that question and not worrying about it anymore. Okay. Further, we read, oh, sorry, go ahead, Karen. So we've got um, a lot of work to do right. and a lot of options. Um, right. And we already agreed to research one option, which is a creative solution for the Churchill problem that takes into consideration bikes and pedestrians and potential property takings. I'm not sure that we need two of them. Thank you. Further comments? Okay, let's see where we are on this one. Sorry, Tony, Tony Keith? I, I didn't understand what Greg said. We're already going to investigate a creative option for Churchill. I don't see what this option brings to the table over and above the one that some of you are already going to spend the weekend <laughs> researching. I guess the question for Larry is, what advantage would this have over the previous one? Uh, I don't know if it would have any advantage over it. Uh, it's a simpler one. That, that's its advantage, I guess. If I may, I think one thing that we might want to consider, so I, I actually, in my mind, uh, Mike Price's idea and Larry's iteration, and in some ways what Elizabeth is talking about, is really doing what Adina identified, which is understanding that the intersections are playing different roles. So we've understood now with the traffic studies that have happened so far that a lot of the turn movements are, are going north and south, off of Churchill, go north, south onto Alma, and that's what Mike Price is trying to solve for. On Larry's end of the spectrum, he's like, well, if you wanted to keep it so that um, so that you have the cheapest option, but maybe not all the turns, that's something to evaluate. Um, what so what Elizabeth was talking about in terms of if you build, for example, a, a hybrid at Charleston and Meadow, and you don't make the turning lane, you remove some of the stacking lanes that happens now, you might have inadvertently induced a lot of traffic. And so the question is, um, again, from a purely engineering perspective, is there a way to look at these things and understand if there's ways where we can reduce cost, but then also potentially understand some of the traffic things? And potentially what the group could do is um, study these, but then come back and at least enumerate what are the pros and cons um, of what was uh, I sort of identified after going through some of what the engineering constraints are. And maybe that would, because again, this will come back to this group before we then recommend to go to city council. It's not that what we're voting today means that we're spending money on it. We're, we're agreeing to have this level of technical review. So I just want to make sure. Okay, we're ready to 
let's have a show of hands on how many people want to see this proposal uh, go forward. Does not go forward. Which one are we doing? I'm sorry, Adina. No, we go, we're going on a consensus. It needs. It needs well, it needs two thirds majority to, to go forward, and it come, doesn't come close to that. So, it, it, I would like to understand if there's interest in doing the same idea that uh, Larry proposed, but for Meadow Charleston, because we're get to them. oh, okay, you're putting in a different bucket. Okay. No, we, we we've now finished the Churchill proposals, and now we will move to uh, Elizabeth's and Rollins. So let's. Uh, let, Larry, we got a time check from Phil. No, I'm just asking. Uh, yeah. well, we're, we're trying to move forward. As, we got to get going. As expeditiously as possible. Um, let's go to Elizabeth's proposal. Greg, did I see you moving around or no? No, I was actually looking at the rejected proposals for Churchill um, and the number of driveways that would have been removed. Um, well, I mean, we're having discussions, so I'm, I'm, one of the things about Elizabeth's proposal is, oh, let's put a new roundabout in a residential neighborhood off Charleston, and that seems to me, given the amount of, of, of difficulty we have changing things with roads, that seems to me like a big barrier. With that said, I know there's more room around Charleston, so it may, the rest of it may be more feasible. Okay, other comments? Tony. So Elizabeth's idea doesn't have to have the roundabout exactly where she's shown it. It can move anywhere in that line. It could even be on a second level around on the tracks, leaving the tracks where they are, and leaving Charleston where it is. But you have a roundabout above. I mean, so to contradict myself, I mean, it's almost like because Elizabeth's proposal didn't come with a diagram, like if this were like a design review kind of process, I would say, you know, come back at the next meeting with a, with a diagram and work with some engineering friends, um, and it might make more sense. So maybe that's a way of supporting having the technical committee look at it, because without a diagram, it's I don't think we're all able to visualize what's actually being proposed. Keith. Yeah. I would say bump it to next next meeting and have come back come back with another roundabout pictures because the technical group is going to be busy with these other ones anyway. It's not like they they have infinite time to churn through all the ideas. But the what I'm struggling with is where is the roundabouts and and what kind of traffic throughput can these roundabouts have? Because if you look at Alma right now, there's a lot of left turns. So it's having some diagrams of where the roundabouts would be would give us a better idea whether it's feasible or not. I mean, there's some things I like about it, but there's a, just some uncertainty with it. And Young? So Elizabeth's idea is reducing traffic I, on Elma, no, no, on <coughs> Charleston Meadow. Then where does those traffic's going to go? Come to the Church of Macadero. I think if there is a good idea, it should be applicable any street, not just particular. I mean, we're talking about it, but I, I'm just thinking, okay, reducing, I mean, it's a good idea, but, you know, ultimately, traffic has to go somewhere. Where is it going to go? Further comments? <coughs> uh, are we getting tired? <laughs> yeah, I I would like to see, as you said, a visual of it. Um, maybe next time it sounds feasible in some way. No. So, I I think um, so. Just to talk a little bit about the agenda for the next meeting, because we've already had to punt two items. So we were supposed to talk about the problem statement and talk about the criteria, and the idea was to be able to get that to council on time. Um, before the December 9th meeting, um, but we weren't able last time to change, to have another meeting in November. So the next meeting we have scheduled is in December. That makes it really difficult to go through all of these things. Um, so I think, um, I mean, I, I hear you that we'd love to understand Elizabeth's proposals more, and I also hear Elizabeth saying she doesn't know how to draw. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, I mean, I think, uh, I, I don't know. I, I don't have a thought on how to handle that other than it's it's challenging. Well, maybe one of the engineers here would like to partner with you. Got a volunteer? 
I know that. <laughs> I think the challenge for Elizabeth's concept is that it requires not so much an engineer because you're not moving, you're moving the roads a bit, but it's much more a traffic engineer. And so that's uh, a question. And so if yeah, a live call out to anyone watching, if you're a traffic engineer who'd like to volunteer on this project, we would love to meet you. Please contact me. Um, but I think that's the, the challenge here. Well, I, I hear, I, uh, uh, I think that um, we're just going to have to work harder on our agendas, that's all, because I think this is appropriate to continue. I think it's got, uh, that's what I hear sort of a consensus about. Uh, so I'll, I'll suggest, I'll, I will move that we continue Elizabeth's idea to our next meeting. Yes, everyone in favor? Okay. Uh, Great. All right, so. Roland's idea. Okay, discussion. This question. I mean, to me, I don't see this as much as a new idea, just a better implementation of what AECOM did. It, I mean, it's, it seems very attractive the fact that all the lay, all the rail and all the tunnels stay within the right of way. That's going to really help with the the construction of Alma. Tony. So I like the idea, I've always liked the idea of submerging this, this train, but I think in this case there's only, after you look at the, uh, the downslopes that Keith has studied, there's only about 2,000 feet, linear feet of tunnel, and I'm wondering if 2,000 linear feet of tunnel is worth buying or, and constructing a TBM, a tunnel boring machine. You, is that a question to, to him, or are you yeah. just raising it? Okay. Okay. If, if that is one a minute. So on the slide that you had, Chantal, if you can uh, uh, pull it up, they, the TBM costs are included. And, and if that's an issue, and you don't mind spending a little bit more time, is what you do is you launch the TBM. Well, first of all, let me go back. The, there's something wrong with the ACOM video, because there's absolutely no way that you can launch TBMs until the other ramp exists at the other ramp. Right? Yeah. Yes? So now that we got that out of the way, <laughs> okay, let's talk about construction sequences. You can build both friends at the same time if you want to. It's a choice. I would suggest to you that you may not want to because you don't want to be impacted two different sides on Alma at the same time, right? So you may actually build one ramp, then when the crew is done, remember that they have learned a lot on the first one, then move on, they build the other ramp, right? Now you launch the TBMs, not with this pit or whatever, you actually launch it down the ramp. And I can show you how that I was done in London. I was actually in London for the, for, the, for the launch. And also in London, they've got an example, when the TBM comes down the other end, you flip it, including the, tra the trailing gear, and you send it back in the opposite direction, that's how you do the other ball. So that would address your question right, thank you. about having to buy two TBMs. Good. Uh, let's start with Judy. Just a quick question for you. Um, I'm concerned about lowering um, the trains, submerging them. That was an interesting word. Um, what happens when it comes back up towards downtown? And how does that, did you engineer it or think about the concept about what happens when it has to come back up in the down to northern Palo Alto area? Yeah. No, this is only South Palo Alto. Well, that's my question, what? is at what point does it come back up? Okay, um, so to answer that, we need to go and look at the creeks. So now, do you want to look at it coming from the south or from the north? This is from the north. It comes it up before Oregon, north? Judy. Okay. Yeah. It's what? It comes up before Oregon. Oh, it does? Yes. Thank you. That's the answer. Is, is that the answer? Okay. That's the answer. <laughs> So what's the impact of the soil composition in Palo Alto versus the soil composition in London? Because you've mentioned a lot of times how cheap this will be because of how cheap it is to build tunnels in London, well, but this is, this is not London. Let me correct something. I, I was wrong about London yeah. contracts. I checked them, and it was, they did the six miles with two different drives. It was $210 million for 3.3 miles, you know, for both poles. That's what it was in London. 3.3 miles, which is double what the ACOM, the um, Deutsche Bank contract was. Yeah, so I am not a tunneling expert, mm -hmm. but I know that London is famous 
for its excavations and the ease of excavating in London. Mm -hmm. And I know that Palo Alto is famous for floods and earthquakes. So there's got to be an impact on the cost of tunneling through the soil we have in Palo Alto versus the composition of the rock that London sits if, on. If you show me the, the layers in yeah. Palo Alto mm -hmm. down to, let's say, I would say 60, 70 feet, you show me the layers, and I can probably give you a pretty good answer. Okay, so you'd need more information, which yeah, is a right. yeah, fair yeah. question. Yeah. Yeah. Do, 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 just show me the geology and yeah. the built. London is famous for very soft clay. Okay. And we're talking about fairly deep tunnels where you don't have to worry about surface effects. Right. That's how they, that's what the, the so-called underground came, the original. So London's underground subway system is the surface lines and then the deep bored tubes, which are smaller physically than the surface lines. So we're talking about those deep bores. That these are, that's not the same thing as what we're talking about here. That's what I'm saying. Exactly. I'm agreeing with you and okay. amplifying what you're saying. Okay. I, I just, I'm very, very skeptical of cost comparisons to the cost of tunneling in Palo Alto in 2020, whatever, to tunneling in some other place in some yeah, other yeah, decade. But, but That's the, my only about, concern well, here. Sorry. Let's stay in order. Greg. So if I'm, if I'm being skeptical about this, mm -hmm. what I'm skeptical about is the fact that it's still not a great separation. Mm -hmm. And we're comparing costs that mm -hmm. may not be comparable. Yeah. Now, AECOM may have inflated the cost in 17 other ways. I don't have the technical judgment to understand that. But I just want to make sure that we're clear about yeah. what right. we're talking oh, about. Yeah, so but Bill, Jake, uh, can I Crossrail is, was just finished in London. So those numbers are fairly current. And Roland is using or has been talking about crossrail numbers. I mean, I was actually there in London and seeing the construction sites a couple of years ago. Uh, I think the bigger issue which concerns me is whether or not Roland has fully conformed with standards, and I don't know the answer, this has to be taken, yeah, like standards safety, yeah. that Caltrain will expect us to be here to, as opposed to somewhat different, perhaps more relaxed European standards for the same kind of construction. Okay, and this forum is not the place to litigate those issues. So you're saying let's have the technical committee spend some time it's on this. It's the only this. way to answer these okay. questions. <laughs> okay. Couldn't agree more. And I, if allow, I, am I allowed to answer any of no, these questions? No, no, no. no. So okay. if I could, if I could Does just. Does anybody know where the TSI is? Could, you know? could I, if I could just propose something to the XCAP members, um, to what someone's point was earlier, this is an iteration on something that has already been studied. Right. So really the difference between what Roland is proposing and what AECOM is saying is that the AECOM folks have taken the shoe fly tracks and moved them into Alma and then built tunnels. And Roland's iteration is keep move the shoe fly tracks to the outside but stay within the right of way and then look at doing the tunnel. And so at a high level, I would think that from a technical and engineering review, at a quick level, we could decide whether that proposal, that general idea is feasible. I, obviously, you would have to go into much deeper design to understand the, the dirt and what have you. But I would just say that the, a vote now would be just simply that yes, it's worth the technical pre-screening to understand whether what Roland just it, you know created um, pushes back on AECOM's assumptions. And given the great interest in Palo Alto at finding a way to build a tunnel, I, it makes a lot of sense to me to do more research. And, and but it, please think about the cost in a realistic way. Yeah, okay, I can only say that Roland's proposal is interesting enough that we absolutely need, I'm gonna put my body on the across the tracks to be this way. We need to look at this one. My body, my body's across the tracks. <laughs> Thank you. Pat's about to save you. <laughs> and, and, and I'm I agree. happy to talk about Crossrail. If anybody's interested, I've only got eight years of Crossrail under my belt. I think it's a really important one to look at. My only concern is how close it's coming to the West Side housing and safety issues. The West Side, the West side where, the yes. where the houses are. We are well aware of it. And Roland, the, we're going to oh, well, sorry, we're going we're to move along. I'll, I'll just say that. <laughs> Okay, are we ready to vote? Sure. I think so. So all in favor of moving Roland's proposal on to the next level? Looks like it's got a, enough of a vote. So, well, one, well, we need eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We had, we had 11 people, so eight out of 11 is more than two thirds. Madam Chair, I return it back to you. 
Well, I thought we were doing your iteration for South Palo Alto. We turned it down. I didn't have one for South Palo Alto. Okay. We had Elizabeth's, which includes a sort of my general idea, but we've continued Elizabeth's uh, idea to our next meeting. Okay. I thought you were just breaking them up by north and south. Nope. Okay. Um, okay. Well, then, yay. We got through that. <laughs> Not without some bumps and bruises, but um, okay. So Elizabeth will come back at the next meeting. Uh, we'll talk offline, Elizabeth. I'll see. We'll, we'll round up some suspects. Um, uh, okay. So the next thing is uh, an update from the working groups on the conceptual work plan. Um, if there's updates from each of the groups, I know Dave, you had an update on your group, um, and then uh, I'll talk about the engineering group a little bit further. So I'll, I'll go first. Uh, so I've been working on property impacts and in domain. Um, and what I wanted to ask this group was, uh, would you be interested in uh, an eminent domain lawyer who's here in the Bay Area to come in and give a short talk on all things eminent domain? Uh, he probably can touch a little bit on property impacts as well, but he'll focus mostly on all the aspects of eminent domain. I think we had allowed for that in the schedule because it's, the idea would be that the property impacts group would be able to come up with questions and then we would be able to have an expert that we could come and ask at least some subset of the questions too. Then a quick uh, oper uh, process question. Um, I wanted to solicit your questions about property impacts in eminent domain, but I didn't want to violate Brown Act. So how do we, how do I do that? Uh, if it's a one-way communication uh, to you and they're giving you their opinion about a, qu a question, then it's not a conversation that's a chain that r arrives at a decision. Thank you. Although running it, it through set staff a, is the conventional way of handling the people. Not necessarily, but you can, uh, you can suggest it. Thank you. I think the idea with the working groups is every there will be topics for each, and so if you have any property impact questions that, and again, these are not, it's not that you're asking Dave to answer something. You are giving Dave questions about property impacts that we would like to eventually have answered by some expert. So it's actually not really a conversation. It's really just saying things that we're confused about. So if you have questions about property impacts, you should just send them to Dave. Likewise, if you have engineering questions, you would send them to Keith, for example. Yeah, don't wait for me then. If you have something, just send it now. <laughs> Um, uh, one clarification thing for the imminent domain uh, person that you're bringing, uh, it's a difference between imminent domain and a property taking because an imminent domain usually means the government is going in and actually taking the property as opposed to compensating someone for it. So if you can talk to that person about making sure that both of those things are covered, I think that would be really helpful. I think that was Eileen's point at a couple meetings ago. Imminent domain is the last case scenario and it's actually a pretty dirty word in most conversations. Yeah, in fact, if you go to a lot of websites that are out there, I've been poking around the net, there's a lot of information about just what you're saying. And so, yeah, I'd love for him to kind of go over the differences and what, what, are, what are all the options. Um, even some people have asked uh, already about uh, what if the city just buys your property, right? There's no eminent domain, but they gave you money for it, right? What's that process, too? Yeah. Do we have any other groups that needed to update? I don't have a group, <laughs> um, so I don't have an update because I don't have a group. So yeah, you you're so um, uh, okay. We'll talk in a second. Go ahead, Adina, and then Greg, and then Pat. I saw. Uh, all right. Um, so I was on the Caltrain group, and Nadia, tell me if I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing here. Um, but what I did was um, check with Sebastian Petty, who's the person who was um, champion, like spearheading on staff the Caltrain business plan about when we would get some of the answers to the questions that I think a lot of people um, have, and, and you know his willingness to come. So one, he's, he's, willingness, he's willing to come, he's willing to come multiple times if the group needs him to come. Um, there are some questions about the timing and sequence of like when there would be more frequent service that right now, um, now that the Caltrain board has decided to approve its service vision as a like, like one big lump sum direction, 
Um, they are now doing work for several months looking at breaking that up into smaller chunks, what order they might happen in, and what happens if high-speed rail happens sooner versus later. And um, they're going to have things to talk about in the March-April time frame. So if he comes sooner, he will not have answers to those questions. And if he comes in you know, March-April, he will have more answers to those questions. So I guess it depends on how much people just want to hear the basics and will be OK with, I'll be back in March, I'll be back in March, I'll be back in March for some of those questions. Um, the other thing that we may not have by then is more detailed scope on their overall grade separation study. Um, but um, that, that's what he said about the timing of the answers to some of those other questions. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, so I, um, I also reached out to Sebastian this afternoon after our conversation. So. Uh, my feeling is that Caltrain has never actually presented to the CAP or to the XCAP. And so even if Sebastian has to come twice, it's probably good for us to have a first meeting in January to cover kind of the basics. And then uh, he can come later once we've got more information. But at least that way we've got some, some understanding, um, especially to catch up the newer XCAP members who maybe haven't heard about some of the other stuff that was sort of told to us in previous CAP meetings but never actually presented by Caltrain themselves. So that would be my update on that. Um, uh, Greg, you had something? And then Pat? Other than we agreed that we would work together on safety, I actually have nothing to report. So we will, we will get together soon. Yes, I agree. And In Young also um, suggested that she'd like to help. Um, and I've also been in touch with Ken Duker. Um, and he is the chief of emergency services, Palo Alto Police Department, as a possible speaker. Um, to address issues related to track safety. Actually, Keith, before you go, I'm going to get, so um, the update in terms of civil engineers that we found, so um, there's uh, four brave souls who have volunteered to help us. Um, we have uh, Ron O's, who's a retired civil engineer who has a tunnel experience, has worked a lot in Washington State. Um, second person is Edgar uh, Ugarte, who um, used to actually work for the city of Palo Alto, but actually worked for the city of Belmont when they built the grade separations of Ralston and Harbor. So has direct experience not only building, building grade separations, but building Caltrain grade separations in the middle of an active train line. So that would be super helpful. Um, we also have um, uh, Sridhar Rao, who is a resident um, who has familiarity with what's called deep soil mixing. So it's the technique that's used to inject concrete into the ground and make tunnels um, and trenches less thick and less wide and easier to do and cut costs. And his experience is directly on some of the BART trenches that, and, that it were built. Um, and then the fourth person uh, is someone uh, named Joe Teresi, who also is retired from the city and worked a lot with stormwater uh, management, so has much more experience on the waterfront. Um, and I've also reached out to the Save the Groundwater folks who are going to try to work with the Creek Group, um, which now also is from what the technical group, because a lot of it has to deal with the clearance levels and stuff. So, and then I'll let you update. Yeah, yeah a meeting set up with Gary Kremen, and we had to cancel, but he was able to answer some of my questions by email. But in particular, like these these lift pump stations that we have. Sorry, do you want to clarify who Gary is? Oh, Gary Kremen is the uh, uh, Valley Water. Uh, what's his title? Um, so board of directors. Board of directors. Board of directors. Okay, and so, Santa Clara. Yeah, Santa Clara oh, Valley Water South District. Valley Water District. It's, yeah, it's okay. just Valley Water. Anyway, he helped with some answers. Some other ones, like, well, he can't make, the, or Valley Water doesn't make the final decision. A lot of it's the permitting agencies, the fish and game, and all that other stuff. So, they can't always say yes or no because they aren't the ones who say yes or no. <laughs> But we anyway, we have some ongoing dialogues. Tony? So I, I won't be here for that meeting on the 17th, but if you can ask the engineers for sort of a template that would make sense for us to, in order to evaluate this, these different alternatives and what the line items are, for instance, excavation, concrete, rebar, and so on, as well as the administrative costs that Will, will the city will incur for each alternative. 
Yeah, I think um, to set the expectation, what the civils and the technical group are going to be able to present back to the XCAP is going to be pretty much guided by whatever documents we're able to get. Because if we don't get documents that are specific enough to uh, for them to really be able to dig in, then they may not be able to push back. Um, but the idea is to have also this meeting where we have uh, with AECOM. So hopefully, you know, we'll get some answers then. So hopefully you'll be able to give some feedback. I know you're leaving, but um, if maybe we can get something in writing in terms of what you're looking for. Uh, can I just have a clarification? Meeting on the seventeenth, you said. It's the technical. The, the technical. Oh, not yeah. not oh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. a little concern. Um, I guess we have to take public comment on this item. Is there anybody from the public who would like to comment on um, the working group update? What about some of the ideas? No, that that will that you'll have to do on the next one. The next time, sorry. Go ahead, Chantal. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yep. So really quick updates for the staff updates. One, you all were, uh, some of you were able to come to the community meeting. For those that didn't, we had uh, about 150 people there. Really good turnout, a good number of people that this was their first meeting. So that's actually really exciting for us to hear that it is people that are coming to the conversation new. So we were able to pass out the fact sheets, able to walk through some of the newer things that have come since the last full citywide community meeting, which was in March this year. So I brought with me today copies of the presentation, if anyone uh, needs a copy, whether you were there or not, as well as I have some extra fact sheets in the back. So even if you have some, feel free to take an extra packet and share it with someone else. Those are a really good way to discuss the alternatives that are um, on the table right now. And I also wanted to let everyone know that the school board, Palo Alto Unified School District, had a conversation at their most recent board meeting, and it was decided that uh, they would not have a representative on the XCAP going forward. So Barbara Best is no longer an XCAP member. The district will still be very engaged in the conversation about grade separation, but I did want to let you all know that uh, she's stepping down. So you are officially a group of 13 instead of 14 members. Uh, and the last thing is, uh, as Ed was leaving, going to another meeting, uh, he whispered to all three of us, <laughs> so not really um, much new, but just to emphasize, we'll try to set up a meeting for next week and uh, related to the technical conversations on some of these ideas that were generated and uh, have AECOM there and whoever can participate related to the technical group and some of the civil engineers. So he did want me to let you know that. Well, is that a Brown Act meeting that is limited to the uh, certain number of people? My understanding is uh, you have designated your technical okay, working excellent. group. Okay, excellent. That answers my question. Thank you. To deeply engage on the topic. And that's it for updates, unless there are questions. I have a question about the schools and why they are not going to participate. Um, so the the best. I think summary would be actually to watch that part of their board meeting agenda because it was a public meeting, so you'll get a better sense of it. But I think that the general sense is because the XCAP is shifting in role and there's uh, voting involved related to the alternatives that they didn't want to um, have to weigh in that deeply on um, picking one or the other. I'm looking to Nadia too because I know you were following some of the conversation um, on each of the crossings. So I think they want to make sure that their concerns are heard and understood and shared, but not to the point where they're voting as part of the XCAP. That's my understanding. But the meeting, I believe, was last week. And so if you wanted to pull up the board video, it should be a pretty short discussion. I would recommend that. It's not because they're not engaged. Okay, and I think uh, unless anyone else has any other clarifying questions on staff updates, with that we are adjourned. Thank you.